No, but their names were like Sandra K, Elthel Lock, yeah, yeah, Elthel May, Betty Rue. You had to say, yeah, okay. All right, story. we are live and in living color. Okay, wait a minute. Welcome. Oh, oh look. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we are live, though. They see us on the Facebook. And thing. we acting a uh, pure crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all right. We're having fun. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome to everybody in Facebook land. Welcome to the True what? Reveal podcast. Hello, everyone. Say hello, everyone. Hello. hello. Yay. So um, welcome to the True Reveal podcast. I will be your host tonight. My name is Latricia, a.k.a. Sweet. So first of all, I just want to give you guys some background about what Truth Reveal is about. So the purpose of Truth Reveal is um, we host conversations that relate in order to reconcile as we uncover God's truth. Tonight, we're going to be talking about a uh, sensitive topic. So we do want to um, put some disclaimers out there. We are talking about um, a very sensitive topic in today's culture, in today's church, and that topic is race. And so we want to ask one that everyone extends grace as we have this very uh, delicate conversation and just be mindful of um, your comments and what you're saying. And if you if you want to show yourself, um, we do have moderators in the room that will remove you. Um, but we do want to have, you know, open and, and open and honest dialogue, but we also want to do that in a very respectful manner. So we're going to have a section of this podcast where it's going to be open for question and answer, and that'll be towards um, the latter part. So if you're on here and you're live um, watching via Facebook, we're just asking that um, you keep your questions towards your end and remember what it is, jot it down, whatever the case may be, and then we will um, tackle that towards the end. So at this time, I would like to introduce um, our guest for this evening to help us dig in to um, discussing race and the church. Um, the first guest I would like to introduce is the one and only Gina Thomas. Yeah. Yay. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Gina is a world-renowned author. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Separated by the border. Get your copy. Um, she's a, a friend of mine and a sister. Um, she's a social activist, and um, she always has good knowledge and things to say. So thank you so much, Gina, for being a part. Um, Thanks for having next, me. You're welcome. Our next guest is James and Lynette Caldwell. Hey, y'all. Yeah. Hey. James Whoop. and Lynette Caldwell are coming to us all the way from Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, they um, I actually know Lynette a little bit more than I know James, but um, they are one. They are a married couple raising two children. And so we definitely um, want to get their perspective. What is it like? Um, being in an interracial couple and being an interracial family and raising your kids in this crazy world. And last and certainly not least, um, we have with us the Antoine Lassiter. The Antoine. Yeah. The Antoine Lassiter. Antoine is a friend and a brother um, and a, my pastor. He pastors Think Kingdom Church um, in Kannapolis, North Carolina. Um, He's good people, and hey, I'm very, yeah. yeah, I'm very glad to have him be a part of this conversation. He he wants to be a comedian in his in his next life. <laughs> wow. Okay, I'll take that. I'll take I mean, that. well, he he's always trying to do his little comedy sets, doing his sermons. Bless his heart. Anyway. <laughs> 
So we, we're, we're going to have fun, but we do want to talk about this topic. So first of all, thank you guys so much, honestly and sincerely yes, thank for you. being a part. Um, we just appreciate you taking one time out of your schedule to have this conversation, time out of your schedule to just be open and transparent. And um, we hope that from our listeners and all those that are um, going to be taking part that we all leave more enlightened, more understanding, and just having a better understanding about race, our part as believers, and the part that the church plays and what we can do. So I'll start off by just asking our guests, and um, just for sake of just keeping it flowing, I'll say Gina, Lynette, and then Antoine, if you guys can just give us like a general awareness <clears throat> Or of racism or your experience. And when I mean general awareness, like that first moment that you were aware that racism is, a, is something that's taking place, or, you know, it could be something as early as your childhood, or just when you came to the realization that there is a difference in the races. Yeah, so when I was, um, about four years old, my mom, um, her best friend is African-American. And I remember asking her why her skin color was different than ours. Um, and, and really there wasn't a whole lot of other conversations surrounding that. Um, but I, at the time lived in upstate New York. So it's a very different world. Um, I would say that racism certainly still exists there as it does here in the South, but moving to the South was, uh, was, very eye-opening to see the, the um, segregation that still exists in a way that it doesn't in New York, or at least- When did you move? Where I live. I'm sorry, when did you move to the South, Gina? Uh, I was 12. Okay. Yeah. Got you. James, Lynette? What's your first experience? So my, my first experience would have been uh, probably sixth, sixth grade, you know, so 12, 12 years old. Um, you know, being, being raised like in the county that I live in, Southern Indiana, you know, 24, 25,000 people, it's a small county and literally 99.9% .9 white. Wow. 99.99875 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is white. Oh, yeah. my. And so, you know, you know, being raised you know, my, my experience with, you know, the, the, the black culture or anything was related to sports, playing basketball, you know, my school, all white, you know, but for AAU basketball, you know, that, that, you know, we were very, you know, multicultural basketball team because, you know, and it's still like it, it is today where you could have players from different schools playing. And my first experience, you know, with the racism was, on one of my sixth grade AAU basketball teams when one of the players on our team and his dad was a coach called another kid on the team, dropped the N word right there mm -hmm. and knew growing up, I didn't get exposed to that. Didn't hear it from my family, but knew, no, that, that, that's beyond what you could ever call. And I remember immediately left practice, told my dad and he was like, Nope, you're done. He was like, do you want to play? And I was like, no, that was my first real life experience that, wow, you know, you, 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 you know, it exists. You grew up <clears throat> not being exposed to it, thankfully. And, and, but when it really happened in, you know, in that present time in front of you with, you know, with, with players on your team, it was just, you know, at a young age, that was, that would have been my first experience with wow. it. Um, that still, I mean, we just talked about this probably a few weeks ago that I remember that. And, you know, being 12 years old, obviously that puts you in an uncomfortable situation, but right. even just, but everybody else, every, all, everybody else on the team was no big deal. You know, that, that's, wow. How, that's that's how we talk to each other no I, I wasn't I was not raised like that or exposed to it so it was something new to me and you know very uncomfortable got you got you what about you Lynette I was I mean I didn't I was thinking probably the very first time because I mean I grew up in Vail so um 
Now explain that for the people who have no concept of veil. <laughs> that's God's country. So that's how we know. <laughs> <laughs> no, veil is my it's Catawba County. So there are two parts of Vail. There's a, a Lincoln County and there's a Catawba County. And it's like I grew up not far from a farm. So it's real rural, as as anybody would say. It's extremely country, like country. <laughs> so um that's where I grew up. And in my neighborhood on the hill, everybody was black. There might have been a couple um couple white people but mostly everybody was black so I went to schools where it was a predominantly white environment but I was just telling James not long ago I don't remember having as many issues I was never called out of my name at my school I played sports might have been the only uh black person on the on the team a lot of times you know so but now that you ask about our youngest um memory of something like that or like realization of racism I would say my very first time that I knew or I felt uneasy was probably third second between second and fourth grade I don't know which one it was mm -hmm. but it was based off of we were looking at a map and Niger you know the Niger yeah mm -hmm. I remember one of the kids in my class started to laugh like nobody had said the word yet they just saw it and one mm -hmm. of the kids began to laugh and like kind of kiki with another one of the kids and at that moment i immediately felt like they think it's the n-word mm -hmm. so they think that's funny no one mentioned it and no one had ever called wow. that called me that but that was like i was kind of like i know what they're thinking so mm -hmm. because no one i don't remember any kids really being that way in, in elementary school or, or middle school. But I felt uncomfortable with that. And it was like, that, that shouldn't even have been something I was uncomfortable with, but I knew, right. I didn't know what they were thinking, but in my mind, I was like, mm -hmm. they are thinking that's funny because of this. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was probably my earliest, like uncomfortable feeling of racism. And it wasn't even racism. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And for those who don't know, Vail is located in the great state of North Carolina. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Vail, I'm sorry, North Hill. Carolina. Yeah. And Juan, <laughs> tell us about your experience. Uh, for me, the it was... One. I think it's for me, it was... Uh, I think I was young. I think maybe middle school. And we were middle at school? a... Uh, yeah, we were at a, uh, a, a gas station that had like a um game room or it had a couple of those um the games mm -hmm. and my younger brother he was playing the game and like he was i think he was real good at the game or something and there was a there was a, a white kid that wanted to play but my brother kept winning and mm -hmm. uh, so his dad came along the the, the the kid's dad came along and uh, was trying to get my brother to hurry up and he said uh, he never did, but he said his son kept crying. They had to leave. But before the father left, he said, um, we don't want to play with that anyway unless we wipe it down. Um, mm, and, I, wow. and I couldn't figure out like what that meant. Like It didn't make sense to me, but um, I remember having a conversation with my dad later on about it. And it just threw me off. Like, why would he say that? So mm -hmm. that was my first. I couldn't, because I was, I think I was mm. maybe sixth grade, but because I couldn't, um, I think I didn't have the the faculties at the time to really digest it. Mm -hmm. So when I look back, that was my first um, experience with it. Got you. April mm -hmm. or Holly, did you guys have experiences that you recall um, growing up where you kind of came to that realization that there was a difference or a separation? I think uh, my first memories probably would have been when it came to dolls like seeing that I, there weren't that many black dolls at the time and just kind of getting socialized to think that there was only one way of beauty through, <clears throat> you know, the things that you would see in the store. So that that's basically the earliest memory that I have that, you know, would be either would be either that or television, not seeing us really represented on television and wondering why mm -hmm. you know, that difference was there. Uh, or seeing a doll and all I saw was white dolls and wondering why is it, it one that looks like me, you know? Right, got you. Oh, yeah. What about you, April? 
Well, uh, mine is a kind of a funny story. I um, I didn't have any like uh, where anything happened to me particular. Uh, I grew up in a military family. Um, we we're from North Carolina. My people are from Rocky Mount, but in the military, I was exposed to a lot of interracial couples and all of that. But funny, my first time I thought about race was looking at a, my favorite book. My mom had bought me a book of Bible stories. And I remember being a little girl and it was like a bound together book and it had the pictures and everything. And I love that book. And I was sitting in my room and I literally was looking at all the pictures and I said, hmm. And I, I didn't feel a bad way. I was like, I wonder when God made black people. Hmm. I said that because wow. I thought I didn't ask my mom or anything. Mm-hmm. I just saw all the white people in the stories and I was like, oh, well, I wonder when we came. Wow. Um, wow. How, wow. How old do you think you were? I had to have been about six or seven. seven. Wow. Mm. Or maybe, wow. Maybe eight, maybe eight, because I, I could read <clears throat> the whole thing on my own, like seven or eight. Somewhere. Oh, okay, so you were able to read. Uh, my first experience was, um, I'll never forget this. I was in Head Start. Um, or pre-K as they call it now and I'm country I'm like Lynette we, we're from the country now she's a little bit more country <laughs> than where I'm from we had like <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> Vail is way country than Shelby I mean Shelby is country too but um I grew up country and I grew up being raised by my grandmother so there's that just growing up country and old, you know, so, you know, like, I mean, I was literally raised by my grandmother and my great grandmother lived in the house. So I, you know, I'm a country girl, you know, cornbreads, collard greens and fat back. That's a whole meal. And (laughs) so I was, oh my. High blood pressure. (laughs) (laughs) So I was at school and I don't remember what we were eating. I don't remember the specifics that deep of of what happened, but I do remember I was at school, I was eating lunch and there was, I don't know, whatever the, whatever the meal was, it had some juices with it and they had given us rolls. And remember I told y'all I'm country. So I was taking the the biscuit, the roll, and it's a word called stop. Stopping it up. I was stopping up the mm. juice of whatever we were eating. And I remember as clear as this day, and I'm not one for remembering names, but I remember her name. Her name was Miss Strickland. She was a mm-hmm. teacher's aide. She wasn't even a teacher. Um, and she said to me, black people don't, white people don't eat their food like that. Black people do. Now in that mm. moment, I was like, I mean, I didn't stop eating, but it was enough for me that even at a very young age, I didn't, I didn't think it was right. So I went home and told my, my mom and my grandmother what the mm-hmm. teacher had said. <laughs> Needless to say, if anybody knows my mama, she went to the school the next day and, <laughs> and turned it all the way out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Because I was in, like, head mm-hmm. start. Wow. And I was thinking, like, just listening mm-hmm. to you guys all share your stories, mm-hmm. you know, I, I can't remember what I did the day before, but it's like certain things happen in your life and they they are so engraved in you that it you have yeah. no choice but to bring them back to your remembrance. And I think that's, you know, that's what race is and that's what racism has done that at 41, I can remember something that happened 35 years ago as a kid with a lot of clarity. Um, Mm. So I think it just shows like how this subject and this, this, this sin, because it is one of America's, it is America's oldest and biggest sin, the sin of racism um, has really played out in all of our lives. So I know Gina um, is, is if there was a justice league, it would be like Gina would definitely be a part of it. <laughs> yeah. There, there is a justice league, but I'm just saying I was thinking <laughs> about Marvel. So Gina, give us some experiences like with your work um, with social justice and what that experience has been like in evangelical settings um, as it pertains to social justice and racism. Yeah, so um, I would say that um, 
I want to give at least one positive example because the reason that uh, I even know y'all um, and Antoine is because um, Andrew and I went to a conference, uh, a Missio Alliance conference a couple of years ago, and we really were interested in racial justice and really trying to figure out what we can do to be a part. And there were several um, that those who were speaking at the conference were um, it was a very diverse group of speakers, which first of all is not the norm. Um, I wish it was, but it's not. And, um, and secondly, there were several um, pastors of color who were saying that if you really, if you are a white person, you really wanna do something about this, um, learn how to be under the leadership of people of color. Um, and that, that really changed the, the course of direction for us and, um, and thankfully brought us into relationship with, with you beautiful people, um, specifically uh, folks at Think Kingdom. Um, so that was, a, that was a very positive experience, but I would say that a lot of experience generally in, um, in white evangelical spaces is, um, as I'm sure you all have heard, it's not a skin problem, it's a sin problem, and you know, all the, all the silly little tropes that we have. Um, and unfortunately, I think even in the spaces that seem um, that seem as if you know things are changing, and and um, one particular church that we were a part of for a while uh, had a, quite a few people of color on staff. Um, and uh, but when you dug underneath the surface of it, um, a lot of that was tokenism in the sense that um, mm. their voices, while they were heard, they were never listened to. Wow. wow and that and that is really i think the thing that's saddest and, and in some situations it's hard to see that that's happening right away when you first enter a new church um but as we started to build more relationships with those who were on staff that were people of color it was very clear um and and it just it just yeah made us really really sad to, to see that happen um, and so really for me, like uh, where I start with all this stuff is going back to the beginning in the Bible and talk about justice. What does justice look like? What does it mean? Uh, where does it come from? And, you know, Isaiah 42 lays out a picture of who Jesus was going to be and he was going to, he was called to justice. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And so I think really trying to change that, uh, the whole language around what is justice. It's not just this negative term. It's not just this term for people who are outside of the church. It is a term. It is a calling is something that we have and we need to go for and Christ is calling us to it. So that's where my heartbeat is. Yes, very awesome. good. <laughs> Thank you. Antoine, so you're my pastor, but you also pastor a multicultural church as a African-American man. What is your experience, one, in that setting and two, um, what is your experience when you're dealing with race in uh in some of your your groups or your sets of individuals that you interact with, well, it's a. Uh, I, I concur with Gina on the premise that sometimes we have to get past language, uh, because anytime you can't agree on definitions, people put a wall up. So, um, mm -hmm. so somebody could be watching and, and saying, "Okay, racial justice." Well, justice should be colorblind. You're absolutely right. But mm -hmm. we're we're living in a culture that it isn't. So we parse words a lot. And mm -hmm. so what ends up happening is like uh, we even have uh, demonized, uh, you know, social justice and social justice warriors. And so we keep parsing these words. Um, but the key to it is the biblical definition of justice. So mm -hmm. whether, wh however it plays out, um, we have to agree upon that there is a segment of the population that does not get a fair dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. So um, I think to, to, your, to your point, I do pastor a multi-ethnic church. And initially uh, I recognized early that there were landmines that mm -hmm. I was very careful about. Wow. And um, to be honest, uh, I, and this is what I want to talk to the pastors who are watching, because I'm just going to be straightforward and honest. Please. So when we when mm -hmm. we merged, um, you know, a prominent, predominantly black church with a predominantly white church, it was months before uh, good, bad or indifferent, the Trump era. 
So <laughs> then you had uh, the death of the African American Keith Lamont Scott. <laughs> so, so now I'm a black pastor uh, in a multi ethnic space, and I'm trying to not only merge two cultures, but I'm also trying to navigate spaces where uh, people will extend grace to me. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and it's, and it's a, it was a hard thing. So, um, and this is why I'm here tonight because what I did not do, I mourn because I didn't speak to the issues of race. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I didn't do that is because I was literally trying to survive. And wow. I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying, the Titanic is sinking. And now mm -hmm. you're bringing up issues that are divided and uh, it's hard to deal with. So many of us don't want to be in spaces, mm -hmm. reg regardless of the conversation, That's we true. don't want to be in spaces where we are uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. So if I step to the left, I'm too black. If I step to the right, I'm not mm. black enough. So I'm having to navigate these spaces. And wow. it's only until I realize that my obligation is, is, is oh. first to God, <laughs> And to mm -hmm. speak to the issues that are affecting the people I'm pastoring. So mm -hmm. oftentimes when you go in spaces that are, when you go into spaces, you, the challenge that we all, all have in these spaces is trying to be all things to all people, mm -hmm. but not to win them to Jesus, but to placate their own comfort. So mm -hmm. if I start standing, wow. if I start standing and I'm offending mm. my African-American congregants, it's lonely. But if then I start standing mm. and I offend my, my white congregants, um, I, I'm lonely. So the, mm. the premise, the, the I guess the, the, the thing that I did and I rationalized was I don't see color. Well, that's la la, that's, that, that's stupid. Like mm. right. why, would, why would God make color for us not to see it? Right. Like, and so, I had to really understand what my purpose and calling was. So if, if I'm a white pastor, black pastor or not, what I have to be careful about is that I don't look at the, the, the faces of the people I, um, I pastor. And so those faces mm. determine the, um, what I preach. So if, wow. there, if, this, if it's social economic issues, I don't preach about uh, how to biblically handle your money. If it's gender issues, I don't speak about it because I don't want to offend if it's sexuality. And this is what mm. I was talking to you about, sweet, that um, it's, my, it's my gap theory. If the church does not talk about race, the mm. world will. That's and the right. world will talk, mm. yes. talk about it from a world view. So if yeah. the church doesn't talk about sexuality, the world would, take, it would talk about sexuality. So mm -hmm. um, that gap will be filled or, or filled with folks who don't have a biblical view. So we label people to keep from digging deeper into mm -hmm. what the core of the matter is. So mm -hmm. I get past definitions. I get past um, the buzz and words, but we have to get to the core. And I think I stole this from Gina by way of sweet <laughs> we have to leave we have to leave room to be offended yeah so oh if Christ brings us to the table then Christ is enough while sitting mm. at that table we have to have hard conversations because I'm yeah. not trying to grow with people that look like the world I'm trying to grow with people that look like the kingdom so mm. we have to confront these issues that we're not dealing with because mm. we're talking about it we're just talking about it in the safety and the comfort of our homes. Yeah. At the end of the day, um, I, I acutely know I'm a pastor, I'm a husband, I'm a father, um, I'm a friend, I'm a brother, I'm a son. But to some, I'm a black man. And so I can't deny that the world will see my color and mm. hide behind the lens of the church. I mm. have to speak truth wherever I go and my reality, and this is, I'm gonna shut up, but we don't good. know, we don't know how to mourn with people. Mm -hmm. So we try to set definitions and cultures in its proper place. But can't you just mourn with me? Can you weep with me? Do we have to wait until the more facts come out? Can we cry oh, together and see yeah. the, the loss of life? Can we just mourn and just say, 
wow, somebody died. We, and what we're doing is we're so polarized that we are mm -hmm. losing our humanity. It's, mm -hmm. They will not oh know that we are disciples by our doctrine. Mm -hmm. They will know that no, we are Jesus disciples yes. by our I, love. I love. So we yes. don't even know how to love anymore. We don't even know wow. how to see a black. We don't even see, we don't, we don't even know how to see a black man being killed. Forget mm -hmm. about race for a second. We don't even know how to see it and more. Like, yeah. oh my God, I don't need to know the more facts. I don't need, I see death and we don't mm. even mourn that. And so we're living in a time of the church where we don't even mourn loss anymore. We right. try to rationalize, well, what did he do? He died. That's what Lord he did. And so what did we he don't do? have that, we don't have that awareness anymore. And I think oh. that's why the world, unfortunately, is taking a place. Because if the church doesn't talk about it, if I don't talk about sex with my boys, they're going to learn about sex. If I don't talk about race with my children, they're going to learn about it. So me being in the position that I am with the audience, be it eight people or 8,000, they give me a platform by the grace of God to speak truth. And sometimes, as my grandmother used to say, truth hurts. Mm. Mm, my Lord today. A whole mouthful. A whole mouthful. <laughs> and Antoine, then, I think, sorry, real quick. No, Antoine, um, what you were saying about um, if if we don't talk about it, I think what's happening a lot of times in white evangelical churches is that the the saying it's a sin problem or we just need to get back to the gospel is their idea of talking about it and that's mm -hmm. the problem is that yeah. that's not talking about it that's right. not sufficient and everyone those who are curious will then go and find others yeah. who are actually having a conversation right. let me oh, speak to that. let me speak to that real quick and that's and that's the problem like right? so instead of saying hey this is hard i don't know i need help because we don't dig deeper we mm. don't go deeper so we, mm -hmm. so it's like, uh, like Gina was saying, it's sin. Okay, it is. So how are we going to deal with it? Like, mm -hmm. how are we going to deal with the sin? And so uh, sometimes what I, I do, and many of us do, we offer answers before we hear the question. So when, when mm -hmm. something happens that, that shock us, it's, it's Job chapter two, three. It's when Job's friends came, they sat with him. Before they offered the discourse, before they try to explain it away, before they made this broad category and sanitize it, they mm. sat with him. And what we fail to do sometimes is sit with people. I, I, mm. I grew up in a culture where one person had to have the answers. Well, that's 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 not true. No one person has the answer has outside answers. of Jesus. Yeah. And so the reason why we don't have these cap these these conversations, the reason why we keep pushing it, and then we say, you know what, I'm called to preach the gospel. Then follow what Jesus did. Jesus spoke to the issues of the day, mm, so he yes. didn't run through it. See, I see pastors as firemen. We run into the fire, not out out of it. And so, if we don't talk about these fire topics, then I'm going to base my theology on a world view. And mm. this is the opportunity for the church to say, listen, sin is wrong. Absolutely. But this is how sin manifests. Sin manifests in racism. Sin manifests in people. I got to deal with my own sins before I deal with yours. So maybe I'm not dealing with it because I haven't dealt with my own sin. So I'm not going to talk about something that I'm dealing with at the moment. And because we're not authentic and because we're not truthful, bear us we become false tellers so we have to mm. play this game where we skirt around the truth because what i want is the truth if if my marriage sucks don't placate mm. me tell me where i am and that is what sometimes we fail to do now i didn't come in here all right I apologize. I yeah, yeah, you, yeah. But preach, my, preach. my point is that's what it is that's what it, <laughs> that's is. What it is that's your point <laughs> yeah, that's thank you sir thank Ooh. you sir that was a good point yeah Lynette and james you guys are unique in the sense of um you guys are obviously an interracial couple living out it yeah i mean kind of sort of <laughs> kind of sort of <laughs> nah but you know like you're in this Indiana kind of rural area. I know we've had some conversations. Um, and then you obviously had, well, not obviously because everybody doesn't, everyone doesn't know that you have two children. Um, so what is your experience like as 
this couple mm -hmm. raising children in this hyper uh, racial world, um, trying to be balanced, trying to make sure that they're appreciative of their of both their cultures um, and your Christians and your servants. You know, you're serving your church. What is that like for you guys? Well, if we could go back real quick to what sure. Antoine was talking about as far as we kind of, the church kind of like skirts away from the issue, you know, it, it's a sin yeah. problem. And James and I have had this conversation, not about the church, but about if there's ever a time that I've had to deal with racism and then I'm, I'm upset about it because it makes me angry. And so there's been conversations where I've talked to him and I, I, I'll tell him, you'll never understand what I feel like because mm -hmm. he doesn't. And he under, mm -hmm. and he will agree with me instead of saying, it's gonna be fine. He agrees and he'll, he'll say, I won't, I, I don't know what it feels like when you and the kids walk to walk in a store and someone says something or someone's disrespectful or someone's a racist, like, because he doesn't receive that same treatment. So in the church, I think a lot of times pastors or members or people inside the church don't talk about it because they can't understand it because they've never experienced mm -hmm. it. And when you don't experience a thing either personally or in, in your family or someone around you, when you don't experience it, I, I don't know how to feel. I, mm -hmm. And I may not even be empathetic because how can I show empathy towards something that does, doesn't affect me and may never affect me. Wow. So, so it makes it very difficult. I mean, as a family, because we've had issues where there's things that I go through on a regular basis, not only being a black woman, but being not only being black, but being a woman and being educated, you know, and, and at one point being a professional, there's things that I will go through that he'll never go through. Mm -hmm. And he'll never, it'll never cross his mind outside of my wife might be dealing with it because as a, as a white male, you know, we're talking about the top. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. socioeconomic, it doesn't matter anything. As a white male in, in America, he's right here. And then everything else, everything else trickles down. So that's one reason why I think the church has a difficult time dealing with racism. The, the white, like the predominantly white churches, because they have leaders and people in, in those churches that will never know how it feels to experience that. So they don't know how to be empathetic because we as black people, we know how to be empathetic for other races and cultures that go through things because we've probably already been through it, you yeah. know? So mm -hmm. that, just to speak on that point right there, that's something that we've had to deal with in a social realm, not talking about the church. And as far as for our family, I would say the first time he and I had dealt with like racism as a couple, and it was when I, I came to Indiana one Christmas, so 1998, because we've been together like that long. So in 98, I came up here. <laughs> <laughs> so in 98, I came here and they have, they had a mall at the time, which is a giant mall. And I can remember um, going into the mall and we were walking together and there was a, a black girl that walked mm -hmm. past us. Cause you know, it's in it, for those that oh, don't know, it's, it's different whenever there's like, we get, I feel like sometimes I get more heat being with a mm -hmm. white man than sometimes, because it's not as people don't see it as often as you might mm -hmm. see a, a white female with a black male. So wow. from my sister, you know, I got this, um, Oh, so she likes oh. vanilla. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I might not have been saved and sanctified. Oh so, my! Like, yeah. <laughs> you you know, told him. James, he was like, "It's fine." It was. It, I was so. Wow. For me, at that time, I'm a college student, and I'm like, "Really? Like, what? What does that mm -hmm. mean? Like, I can't." Even though it, I did, I liked vanilla, but I didn't want her to be like the way she said it. <laughs> you know, the way she said it offended me because I was like. What you like how are you gonna call me out like it's not that big of a deal so that was probably mm -hmm. together a person mm -hmm. of our age like in our age group because you know there were always older people yeah we would get the i mean especially in college in shelby in shelby go out in to eat go, go to the mall in shelby we went to gardner Webb. yeah we went to so gardner Webb. that's where we met mm -hmm. we would uh you know it was obviously the much older generation 
that would give us that look or that stare. Mm-hmm. And, it's like, and she would notice it because, I I, you looking. know, me, me just, you know, me being a guy that, you know, you call it naive or whatever, she's got those eyes and those ears constantly looking for it in case it's happening. She'd be like, did you hear what they whispered or did you? No, I'm sorry. I, I didn't. And <laughs> she'd tell me, she'd be one thing of, well, it's a probably good thing. I, I didn't hear that or do this and that, but, you know, and then getting back to, you know, the, the, you know, the, the topic of, you know, with me not being able to, you know, know how she feels or anything. And we have, we've had some, you know, we have really, you know, butted heads over that because obviously we're, we're, we're two totally different sides when we're, when we're talking race and our experiences and, you know, I've, I've been aggressive with her and my stance and obviously her back with, you know, her side, you will never understand. You will never understand. And then my stance is always, okay. When I say I understand, I understand how you feel when they said that, or they treated you this way. I understand on a level of, of comprehension and being sympathetic and being a human being you know, with love and, and compassion. I, I can't, I will, I can never say, I know how you feel. Mm-hmm. I, under, I understand. And then she will come back, you know, you, you can't understand it if you don't experience it. And that's where we kind of, kind of clashed of you're taking it from one point of view. I'm taking it from, I understand completely. If I didn't understand, I would say, I, I, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. You've experienced it or whatever. I, I can't say I know how you feel because I am not in her shoes. I, I'm not experienced. I have not experienced that. So I don't know how she feels, but I can say, I understand that you're broken, that, that it just, you know, just cut you to the core when, when you mm-hmm. experience that. I don't know how it felt. I'm mm-hmm. sure. And I understand that, that it, it, it feels horrible, but yeah, I, I don't know how you feel or have felt when, when things like that happen. And what we do with our kids I mean, sweet, like we talked about earlier, um, when they were very small, well, probably till four or five, they were extremely pale. So there were many instances. Oh, wow. You know, (laughs) so it's like, who's babies? You know, we're walking at Walmart or I'm rolling them around because they just didn't look, at that point, they didn't look um, interracial at all, biracial at all. So sweet, what we were talking about, like they were passers, you know. At that mm-hmm. So we would get that and when we would go to Walmart, um, mm-hmm. but they didn't know. So uh, they had no clue of the skin color because before we moved here, we lived in Hickory and, you know, my parents were there, all of our family. And then we went to um, a multicultural church and there were interracial relationships there. So it wasn't a thing we talked, we talked about, but it was just something that you would hear, you know, in the background with the kids. Um, when we moved here, um, they were four and three. Yeah. No, three, two and three, two and three. Yeah. Yeah. So when we moved here, um, the older they got and they would go to parks and how they were treated with him would be different than how they were treated with me. And Mm. then when we were all four together, it would be different too. So we just had to navigate that. And then I think the first time I realized that my one of my children understood racism color. The kids. Well, with color, just okay. color. We um, because we live in a predominantly white environment. Um, I had taken our daughter into a little speedway, like a gas station, and she said she was so little. I just remember she was able to speak, and she goes, "There was a black lady and like a, her daughter that came in, and they were older." And she goes, "Rowan was like." Look, mommy, there's black people. Like that made me excited. <laughs> oh, wow. <She> was excited. <laughs> so, and at that moment, I never knew that she actually knew the difference because mm. we don't speak about it. But to her, because she was probably always listening, she always does. She probably had heard, you know, black, white, brown, but it was so shocking. And I remember as I'm holding her, I'm, I remember being like, be quiet. You know, I didn't want, because <laughs> I didn't want them to know that we were the only ones there, like the, the people that were traveling. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe she said it. So that's the first time I think that she mentioned something like that. And she was little, like she wasn't in elementary school yet. 
Mm-hmm. So we, we've had to discuss color because we've ran into racism in the schools because, mm-hmm. you know, there's generations of racist people here and mm-hmm. no matter what it is. And when I worked, when I was worked in the community, I ran into racism because I worked for mental health and I've worked as a social worker um, in this community. And so when I, I had to go into homes and I had to, to see rebel flags and KKK type things and people uh-huh. that I knew hated me because mm-hmm. of my color. They had no idea what type of person I was. But when I was working at uh, mental health, I dealt with children and social skills. So I did social skill groups with kids. And the children here were it was just, just kind of like underdeveloped. So we, we worked on things so much as ordering food and going, we live on an exit that's like 30 minutes north of Louisville. So there have been people, children that had never been to Louisville, which is 30 minutes wow. away. Mm. They'd never crossed the bridge. So they hadn't been to the mall. They hadn't been. So we, we worked on social skills and those people were kind of like hesitant to have me in their homes because I had to go into their homes. But when they realized that I was still helping their, their children, it made a difference. But, mm. um, when I first got here and worked with a community, they would like come up to my face. Like the kids it was like wow. I was a unicorn because yeah. they had never wow. seen a black person in person, in person. like mm, on TV, wow. but never like, like, and they were so little and they're so innocent and they would just be like, Oh, Miss Lynette. So it was, it was an eye opener. It was a culture shock and eye opener. And that's what we've had to talk with our kids about. Because just last year, and this is our last story, just last year, this past school year, our son dealt with severe racism for three months. The beginning of the school year, we had no idea um, because he wasn't telling us. So on the bus and in school, on the bus, it was worse. There were these kids that would, instead of calling him by his name, they would call him the N-word. Now we have, we told our kids that's not acceptable. Like your name is this, your name is that, like you don't answer to anything but that. So he- And, and, the, and the, this thing, it was new to us. Don't know if it's, if it's existed, you know, elsewhere, but the, these kids doing this, at asking, you know, the black kids or the, the biracial kids of, hey, can I get the N word pass? Wow. So that was something new. And it's like, they're, they're asking these kids for permission to disrespect, to them. disrespect them and wow. call. And it's like, what that, that's what we've resorted to. We, we are at this level where our kids, this young generation is getting it from somewhere or it's, it's getting developed to where they want permission. Wow. We call them the N word. And it's called, hey, can I, can I get the N-word pass? Yeah. So wow. he, he dealt with that in the school. And then on the bus, there was just <clears throat> blatant disrespect. And so for three months, so it was the beginning of school. So we're thinking, because there were things that he was doing that he was trying to change. Sixth grade, first year of, of middle school. Yep. So he's trying to, we thought it was just a transition pro- issue, you know, where he's mature in puberty, whatever, because he wanted to change his hair. He's got curly hair. He wanted to change his hair. He started asking Lynette to straighten his hair. Use the flat iron and straighten his hair. Yeah. And again, at the time it was, you know, he's just wanting to be his own person. And then, you know, not, not to interrupt you, but then as everything evolved and we started getting more and more information and realizing that. Hmm. He was around so many white kids. He wanted to look mm. like them. He was he he didn't want his curly hair. He mm. he didn't feel accepted, wow. and it hurt. Mm. It was hard because you know when you mm. you have like beautiful people like we we try to show them all the aspects of of the world, and it was so like heartbreaking because. So the kids that were being good to him, like his friends, loved his curly hair. Everybody, mm. the kids were trying to get perms to look like him. They'd be like, Jason, we love this, we love that. Mm. The kids are trying to get a tan, okay? Wow. And so whenever he doesn't want a tan or want to go out because he doesn't want to get a tan, it was like, buddy, but you're fine. So mm. we had to go to the school and we had to talk about it because it makes you 
he, what called me to the school, what happened was I had to go to the school because the counselor called me and said, you have to come right now. Jamison said, I just want to kill myself in class. Mm, no. And another wow. kid heard it. And so because that kid heard it, they went to the, to the counselor or the teacher. I'm not sure the counselor. And so the counselor was like, oh gosh, you know, no, no. So this is probably the third month. And we're mm -hmm. still thinking, because we're pretty hard on the kids as far as we got grades. We want to make sure that we're doing the right things. And we were thinking, well, maybe we're too hard on him. Like he was stressed out about work. Mm. And then finally he just broke and told us what was happening to him for three wow. months. Now, since August, wow. this is August, September, October, yeah. right? So these are the things that are going on. So then it all makes sense why he wants his hair straight, why he doesn't mm. want to get outside or if he's outside, he wants to wear a hat. Wow. And we found out <clears throat> it was like devastating because mm. We try to empower our children and let them know both sides of our cultures. I mean, from the hills of Kentucky to the, the country back in North Carolina to where we live right now. We try to take them to different places to be cultured. Even though we live in a predominantly white area, we try to take them places so that they're around other children so that they actually know how to interact with other mm -hmm. races. And, yeah. you know, so to have this happen and then to have people be upset because we were taking steps as a parent to be like, stay away from my child. Because my what, mm. what our son told us, because when I asked my first thing was, well, did you not tell anybody? And he said, well, I couldn't. Um, they're not going to do anything anyway. So oh. we have this child that has strong, like a, a high self-esteem around us. He's an athlete. People love him. Kids love him. We go to church and he's loved. But at school, he felt insecure and mm. he didn't feel safe on the bus. He didn't feel like the bus driver would do anything. He didn't feel like his teachers would do anything. And that bothered us because we're in communication with his teachers on a regular basis. You know, when we're talking about grades, whatever the situation may be. And to find out that it had gotten to the point, because you know, you see it on the news, you see people's kids that have committed suicide because of, because of bullying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, That's horrible, you know, I can't believe it. But then here we are, we're those people. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. child says, I, I just don't want to live. I mean, I don't want to. And we're thinking it's us, the yeah. stress of our parenting, when in actuality, it's because he has nobody to, to look like him. And he, when I asked him, why didn't you do it? Why didn't you tell us or tell someone? He said, because I wanted friends. So wow. I, there's nobody mm. else like me. Like, there's no one else that would around me. So if, if they're going to pick on me, then I'm going to laugh at them. And I'm, I'm just going to be like, I'm going to, if I can't beat them, I'm going to join them. That was the mentality. Wow. So even at the school, he allowed them to call him that because oh, he man. called them his friends. And I remember mm. sitting in the principal's office and I remember saying, they're not your friends. And the principal would say to me, you know, they, they call each other friends. And I remember telling her, I was like, adamant, they're not his friends. Because mm. if you have to ask permission for something, then you know it's not right. That's so right. Yeah. If you're asking myself mm. for permission to call him a name, and I don't care if it ends in an ER, if it ends in an A, yeah. it's not right. Mm. It's disrespectful. Right. I don't mm -hmm. care if you hear somebody that looks like me say it, it's yeah. unacceptable. It is. So that is what, that's our most recent issue. And, and our daughter is a little bit more like like me. Like she she will let you know. Don't talk, my name is Rowan. Don't call me anything else. She will fight. And she will, she takes a <laughs> door, you know, play. So she, you know, she heard anything like that on the bus because I think what was happening was they were sitting in different spaces on the bus. So I don't mm. think she heard it. I think she heard it once after we had recognized there was an issue and she let us know and he let us know as well. But it was just, it broke my heart to the point of when he said, I don't have friends and there's no one else like me. So I want, I allow this poor treatment mm. to happen because I'm by myself basically. Wow. So at that point we knew we needed, even though as much as we were doing to culture our children and get them around other kids and other people like them, we knew we had to do something else because it didn't matter what we were doing, no matter what efforts we were putting in place, our son still felt like I'm alone and I don't want to be alone. I want to be with people. So I'm willing to accept unacceptable behavior and treatment to be a part of something. Wow. So yeah. that's, that's why we feel like it's important that, and all of our friends that have reached out to us, we let them know. And they're like, I'm so sorry. Cause there's, everybody's not that way here. Right. So we have right. to make them know that we have support 
And they're like, well, what can I do? I've had somebody DM me because I, I just recently talked about it on my Facebook page. And they were like, well, what can we do? And I told her, I said, what you can do is teach your children to love everybody. Right, like, right. like yeah. teach your children that it's okay, that we're going to be different and our color may be different, but be loving. And I, I, found, I find myself saying that to her but it's funny when I was pregnant with Jameson, with our son, we were in North Carolina and the, at where my husband worked, he was over a, um, a high population of Hispanics. And so we became friends with them. And I remember one of them telling me while I'm pregnant and he was like, will your, will your, will your baby know Spanish? Cause James is fluent in Spanish. So he's like, well, your baby knows Spanish. And I was like, so well, is Gina. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, maybe, maybe he will. And he's like, teach him Spanish so that my babies will have friends. Wow. And at that moment, it didn't affect me as much because I didn't have a bait, like a physical baby yet. But I find myself 12 years later sharing with a Caucasian friend of mine when she asked me, what can I do? I find myself telling her the same thing. Teach your children to be better. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I received racism living here by myself. And then we moved back to North Carolina and then we had kids. So I was a little apprehensive to come here with children, but I dealt with it differently. And now as a mother, it hits a whole different way mm -hmm. yeah. because you can do what you want to to me. You know, you hear your grandmama and your mamas and your aunties saying, you can do what you want to me because you can't mess with my babies. And that's exactly how I feel. It's like, it's a whole nother level of emotion and hurt because mm. He literally was doing nothing. He was innocent. Like we'd be on the bus or in class doing nothing but existing as, as, mm -hmm. as they see him as black because mm -hmm. no matter how pale he is, his mama's black. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he is. So they just, him being there existing was what caused him to have the problem with them, that, them to have a problem with him. Mm. So that that's what's he was just innocent. And that's what hurts me the most is that he did nothing. He wasn't acting out. He wasn't loud. Wow. He just was being himself. And that created the, the issue. And, and, and mm. you know, one, one of the experiences that I mean, really, th this, you know, kind of, you know, took went to a whole new level. He had another situation on the bus and it was I think this was probably it was the one of the last situations that we had because we were at the school and the principal was wonderful, was wonderful yeah. uh, you know, and obviously, you know, as principal of predominantly white middle school, when you have racism in, in the school that's happening, it's you know, it, 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 it's, it's new. And plus, you know, with, with us as parents, not sweeping it under the rug and telling your kid, it happens. You're just going to have to be thick skinned. Right. It's going right. to no, you know, and so, you know, one, one of the situations and, you know, and individuals that I've talked about with, you know, other adults that told them, you know, kind, kind of the situation, you know, get mi mixed reactions on, well, James, you went too far. You shouldn't have done that. And when I explain it, you know, it, it's one of them where, you know, th this kid on the bus calling the N word again, doing this and that. Jameson mm -hmm. gets off the bus. We get in the truck. And because the kids' bus stop was after our bus stop. Oh, oh. Okay. And I'm out of town. Mm. She's I'm out, out of town. She's out of town. <laughs> and, you know, just thank the Lord. Your love for your kids and the flesh can be weak when you're under <laughs> situation. And instead of, in, instead of uh, you know, WWJD, what would Jesus do? It was one of them, WWJD, what would James do? And that uh, <laughs> does sometimes. But mm. we hopped in the truck. We went straight. He knew he knew where the kid lived. Get off, and so we parked there. Kid gets off. I said, "Point the kid out to me." And don't know what they feed, they feed these kids these days, but this eighth grade kid was mm -hmm. twice yeah, my size. I said, "Wow!" I was like, "That's the kid that was calling." It was like, "Yeah." I said, "That that's a grown man." Mm -hmm. like, he's, in <laughs> he's in eighth grade. He's in eighth grade, Dad. And so I was like, wow. "Okay." So. He's standing there, and so I pull the truck up, and I ask him, you know, what his name is, and he's like, yeah, and Jameson's in there, and Jameson is very uncomfortable, but I, I, I'm just, I'm upset, and I, and I confront the kid, you know, in my truck, and I'm telling him, I said, you've been calling my son this, I said, and I just, talk, I said, that's disrespectful, I said, that shows a level of ignorance, you know, just what 
dads would do in a situation like that when you're upset. And and I t- asked him where where his parents lived. I want to talk to their parents. I'm not telling you, you know. And I told him just flat out, you you know, don't ever call my son, you know, that again. Actually, don't ever talk to my son again, you know. And left, and 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 the principal ended up calling. Was like, yeah, I can't believe you, you know, went and did that, you know. And then the, the other parent, the the dad, you know, we met at the school, yeah. And you know, he's like. You know, what he did is wrong, but what you did, you know, was poor taste and was equally wrong. Was, e- was equally <laughs> wrong. And I can't believe you did that. You know, mm-hmm. that pretty much, you know, that that's, you know, you should have been man, you should have been a man and come to me and this and that. And, you know, I, I looked at him, I looked at the principal and, and I told, told Lynette, I don't know if I had, you know, told this to Lynette. And I looked at them both <laughs> and I said, listen, the situation all I'm coming in, out now. No, no you can't find another parent. I said, you know, let me know if there's another parent that has experienced Mm. this with their kids on and tell me how they react. Because if you can find another parent that has went through this, let me know. And I would like to know how that I said, but here's the situation I'm in and how my heart and how I acted on this is if I didn't do that, or if I don't do this and stand up for my kids and set an example that what if Jameson has a son or a daughter and this happens to his son or a daughter and his son or daughter comes to him and says, dad, this is what happened to me. I said, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to have my son Jameson be in a position to where he looks at his son or daughter and says, you know what? That happened to me. My dad didn't stand up for me and didn't confront the issue and didn't stand up for me. I said, I'm Mm -hmm. not going to allow my son to use me as an example of he didn't take up for me. I said, so you know, I said, you know what? I could apologize to you for disrespecting you. I said, I will, I can apologize to you a million times for taking that action. I said, I will never put myself in a position to apologize to my son yeah. for not standing up for him and, mm. and being a voice and being an example. And the room was quiet. There was no <laughs> response. There was, there no was silence Ooh. in heaven. <laughs> I mean, it was just. It, and he asked us, the stepdad, he, he was like, well, I don't know why it happens. I don't, I don't know where it's coming from. And I said, well, it has to come from somewhere. Yeah. And right. so it's coming said, from somewhere. It does. And he said, mm-hmm. well, I just don't, I, I don't understand. And I said, well, let me break it down to you this way. Because I'll try to give it to you in a scenario where you may understand or you may empathize with it more. I said, imagine if you had a child that was physically or mentally handicapped. And mm-hmm. that's something they can't, they can't, they were born with it. They can't change it. They can't control it. They can't defend themselves from it. And so I said, imagine if they're on the bus and they have kids that are constantly calling them names over and over and over again, or hitting them in the back of the head, or Mm. just berating them over and over again, calling them, uh, you know, just anything. They can't defend themselves. And then they come home to you and they say, "Um, dad, this happened to me. You're going to be livid because your child can't walk, they can't raise their arms, but they're taking this abuse constantly over and over again to the point that they want to kill themselves. And I said, Mm -hmm. and then when they get home and you have to go to the school and you are irate, how would you expect for the person that you're, you're meeting the person who's, you're the parent of the child that's doing that. What would you, how would you feel? Like, Mm -hmm. and I think that's, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was just saying he would be he would be very, very upset. And then when right. I said that, I feel like it kind of like he understood better. Because mm-hmm. when I say mentally handicapped and I, I gave him the image of a, a wheelchair and a, a person that can't raise their arms to defend themselves or fight, and they're constantly being berated over something that they have no control over. That child cannot control the fact that he's mentally handicapped or or physically handicapped but yet he's being made fun of because of those things, you would be irate. And, and right. no reason but to defend them. And it's not over something they can control. Right. Mm. And I think just to kind of segue into another conversation or not another conversation, but a question. And this mm. is something that Antoine brought up. Um, he mentioned it and something that you also mentioned, James. And I want, um, I want Gina to... Uh, talk about it and kind of go down the list and anything that you guys want to share, Holly or April. But the question that I wanted to ask you guys, um, because 
you know, this kid's father is like, I don't know where this comes from. And I believe that racism is taught. Um, mm -hmm. So for him to say he doesn't know where it's coming from is, is for him to take the easy route out. It's coming from you, sir. He's been exposed to it somewhere. So mm -hmm. how does the church, um, because we're all believers on this um, uh, podcast, how does the church begin to have dialogue surrounding racial equality um, in a manner where we don't allow the world's culture to influence our opinions, meaning uh, kind of what you were saying, Gina, sometimes it's like we go so far left where it's like, we're just going to pray about it. Or we go so far right that it becomes like a whole movement filtered through hatred. How do mm -hmm. we find that, uh, that middle ground to having this very, very important conversation that we have to have and be that change? So I'll start with you, Gina, and then um, segue into Antoine. Um, well, I think one of the, the important things for, um, and this is certainly church members that are white parents of white children, um, if you don't teach your kids about racism, they will learn racism. And mm -hmm. I think that's the thing that we're not, we're not understanding and we're not getting is that if you are not intentionally teaching your children about racism, they will learn racism, whether you are racist yeah. externally, right. mm. you know, at this level or this level. And, and one thing that I really like George Yancey, he talks about how as a white person, he's not white, but he's saying as a man, he can only ever be uh, anti-patriarchal man, right? And as a white person, he says, the, the best that I can be as a white person is an anti-racist racist. And so I constantly mm. have to be working on that. It's not ever going to go away. It's ingrained in me. And if I'm not intentional about working mm. on it, I will never move beyond it. And I will always pretend that I'm not racist, but mm. I am. Mm. And I think that that's really part of what we need to get to with our kids is to understand as white parents of white children that the system, uh, everything around us, it's in the air that we breathe. It's demonic. I don't Come know on that loud and clear. Oh, it's demonic. Lord. Yeah. And if we are not being intentional yeah. about it, we are not in the spiritual warfare that exists around it. Come on now. Mm. So, so that's that's step one. And and part of that is like in our churches, children's church should be talking about racism. Come on, that Gina. Be a See part. April. <laughs> <laughs> that should be a part of, of our programs and our talks. Mm. And if we really do believe that this is demonic, then let's get in this spiritual warfare and let's start fighting this thing. Cause it's not mm. going to happen if we sit back and let the world do it or sit back and say, I'm not racist. So I'm not part of the problem. Come no, on I'm a white person. I'm part of the problem because I have lived off of the privileges of being a white person and I will continue mm. to do so. So we got to mm. do that. And then next thing from the pulpit, talk about Come racism. On. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes. Whatever color you are, talk about racism. Scared. Come on. That's all, all right, all Antoine. So uh, and another thing that I think is important is that uh, it's your dinner table. So That's what good. we do is That's we good. gather, we gather, and we, we have programs, we have systems, and we have Christian and we sit for hours. Well, after the pandemic, we sit for 40 minutes. So, <laughs> and, and we hear and we get all this information, but information never leads to transformation, right? So mm -hmm. we're becoming smarter and we're becoming able, we got all this information at, at our fingertips. And now we have vocal, we have folks who are demonic being vocal. So yeah, racism, yeah. I, I agree totally, racism is demonic. And so we don't speak to those things. So we sanitize it, right? So how I got to know Gina and her husband, Andrew, was literally not at church. It was in their homes. It was yeah. sitting around their dinner table. Yeah. It was being exposed and being uncomfortable at times, but learning to love each other like Christ did. So when you look at Acts chapter two, they continue in the apostles doctrine. That's the word of God. And they fellowship. So 
I think what we, because you can do a sermon series on on racism, but that doesn't change anybody. Mm. Um, but that mm-hmm. is part of it. It's like an awareness. You got to have an awareness. So, um, what I'm seeing is that we can come together and we can, because some of it's not racism, some of it's cultural issues, right? So mm-hmm. we can come together and we just have different cultures. But if we're not sharing life together, then the only, only thing we're doing is pretending that we're a family. Mm. We're pretending mm. that we're a community. Mm. So mm. Um, it's when, when James and Lynette was talking, um, All right, one that was saying, if you never offer a solution, you oh. literally sat with them. like we we heard they were sick and we did I we may not have had that experience, but you know we have a heart. And, and when brother was about to fight with his son for his son, we literally waited, listen. And hail that moment. Antoine, yeah, repeat. I need you to repeat everything you just said yeah. because you were breaking up when you said sorry, when James. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. When you said when James and Lynette were talking, can you start that over? Sorry. Yeah. When. So, so when they were talking, we were in that moment, we didn't try to stop issues. We didn't. We didn't. We tried to move. On. We we get that moment. And I think sometimes we have a tool of doing allow people to feel feel. Am I here? Oh, hear me. He is still breaking up. I apologize. <laughs> Let's see. Yes, move on to somebody else. That's the Lord telling me to shut up. No, okay, now you, now we, we can, can hear, hear you. Me now. <laughs> so, so third so time the was, charm in that yeah. moment. <laughs> okay. So in that moment, it, we 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 held them right. Right. So we, we didn't move on from the conversation. We weren't trying to butt in. We weren't trying to say, don't feel that way. We yeah, stayed yeah. with them. And I think yeah. some, and as uncomfortable as it is to hear that and to the anger that I feel, we hail them. Mm. And sometimes right. what I see in, in churches, and, and, and I try to fight against it because, again, I'm not perfect. We reduce relationship to series. We reduce mm-hmm. discipleship mm-hmm. to programs. We oh, reduce my. the human experience through three points and a close. And that's mm-hmm. not what we need. What we need is to sit with James and Lynette and and, and like Gina, I heard this word, but she like almost patented it. It's like lament. It's like yeah. hold, like hold mm-hmm. them and hold them in that moment and say, listen, I don't. I, I may not have that same experience, but I'm holding and I'm in tears and my heart breaks. And my, I might yeah. not have a white child. I may not have a black child, but I have children. And so yeah. I, I can I, I can have empathy yes. because I hear what you said and it hurts me. Right. Mm. We don't have to move on to another series. We don't have to move on to another program. Can we wait, hold each other? We have reduced the gospel of Jesus Christ to a cultural experience. No, this is transformational steroids. This mm. is where the gospel was so unique because it brought the male, the female, the the, the slave, the Jew, the Gentile, the Jew. I mean, it brought us together. Yes. And yes. so we, can't, we keep moving on. So what I'm mm. talking to my pastor friends, both white and black, I, I don't want this just to be another moment. Let's right. start with dialogue. Let's start with conversation, but let's not end there. Let's invite each other to hard places and, and, mm-hmm. and allow people to step on each other's toes. And, and the reality of it is I have seen, but here's the challenge. And this is and this is where I shut up at. As long as I call sin, as long as I have a broad category as sin, I can pick and choose whether that's my issue or not. So That's then good. I drill it, I drill mm. it down a little bit more. So if yeah. I say, okay, we deal with lust, people will nod their head and like, yeah, everybody got lust in their heart, and blah, blah. Mm-hmm. So then if I say, okay, who's dealing with pornography, everybody shuts up. Now we just acknowledge <laughs> that all yep. have sinned and fallen short of the glory right, of God. Right. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen, mm-hmm. preach pastor. We just yep. acknowledge that some of us deal with lust. Oh, that's mm. good. That's good. That's good. But when I step on your toes, you get quiet. 
That's mm -hmm. right. I don't deal with racism potentially because I'm a step on your toes. And mm -hmm. then what's connected to yeah. me stepping on your toes is buildings, budgets, because you can't tell me that mm. you are not I'm on here. Cain and Abel. This is what's crazy. Cain kills Abel and his blood is crying out from the earth and it reaches God. You mean to tell me, sir, that the blood of the folks who are being murdered in our streets are not crying out to God? You mean to tell me that we can? You mean to tell me that we can ignore it? Ignoring it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And so while we keep burying our heads in the sand, I have an eighteen-year-old son that I have to teach how to respond to the cops. And so you may not have that experience, but can you mourn with me? Can you dialogue with me and try to figure out? Why I feel the need to do that, right, wrong, or indifferent, don't judge me. If this is my present reality and Jesus has not come, then mourn with me because of the sin that's plaguing me because of it. And that, mm. my friends, and this is my heart, and y'all hear me, and I repent openly. See, I couldn't, I didn't, I didn't lean into those spaces because I was fearful. And so I'm talking to pastors who are fearful into leaning into those spaces. You got to hear the cry of God's people. So diversity is not about assimilation to a culture. Diversity is literally saying, I got black, brown, and white people who are made in the image of God, the Imago Dei. The day. I have to address all the issues that my people are dealing with. So I'm going to have to deal with the sexism that sometimes is in the church. I'm going to, and see, here's the part that I, I really want you to hear me. I'm not beating up the church. I love the church. Mm -hmm. I, I, I understand mm -hmm. the church. I was raised in the church. The church has birthed me into the kingdom, but we as flawed people have to earn shopping's iron. So I don't get everything right, but when I listen to a Gina, I don't get everything right, but when mm -hmm. I listen to a Lynette, and, and James, I don't get everything right, but what I'm trying to figure out is, okay, if you don't know the next steps, then first call me and let's mm -hmm. just talk. I don't want to do another Facebook Live. I don't want to do another <laughs> post to show um, solidarity. I'm saying, can we speak truth in love? And if you see the sin in me, call it out. Mm -hmm. But if I see the sin in you, I should call it out in love and that's what the issue is yes. i think we need to we need to teach our children we need to make disciples but the core of it is if either i'm ignorant okay i get it you don't see it or i'm ignoring it mm. i see it but mm. i'm not going to address it and mm -hmm. that's a heart issue because yeah. i want to get doctrine right I want to get theology right. I want to get Christology right, how we view Christ. But every time I watch Christ, every time I read about his magnificent glory, I see him leaning into these hard places. Come I on. See him mm, going come on. To, against the religion. I see him leaning into it and speaking up for the women, speaking up for the minority, mm -hmm. speaking up for the poor. So if Jesus is our example, then how far off are we? Man, I feel like preaching. Oh like my preaching. God, you are preaching. You, you don't preach a good sermon there, sir. That's a mighty good offering. Oh God. my God. Oh, in that case, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> my cash <laughs> happy. <is. laughs> I said you deserve, you deserve. <laughs> Lynette and James, how do you think, because I know you guys are both leaders in your church, um, in music ministry and probably other areas. What do you think um, the church can do to start having this uh dialogue and conversation pertaining to racial equality and injustice? Well, I, I think, you know, the, the, the church, you know, is, it should and always be what your community looks to for leadership, you know, and guidance. And it should never be one of those situations where, you know, ignoring it or, or hoping it never happens in the church or it, it's not happening around you. You know, and, 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 you know, like with our church, you know, Lynette, you know, we may have, I don't know, six to 700 that flow through. Now, we're not here recently because of, of the, the quarantining and everything, but, mm -hmm. you know, we will have six to 700, you know, members of the congregation flow through because we'll do multiple services. But she, I'm the only one, she will be the only black person on stage. You're the only one? Only one. Wow. 
Wow. That's a hundred percent. Cause you know, we got two kids that's 50. <laughs> so I'm the only one <laughs> that registered. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> But yeah, and we may have some visitors. Yeah, so, some visitors, and you know, but as far as you know, full time members, and you know, she, you know, m- mentioned it earlier as well. But you know, at our church, you know, she is like that unicorn. I mean, she is loved. She is. If there's a weekend that she is not scheduled to sing, you know, I mean, I and but it's a weekend that I'm scheduled for the bass. So, you know, during the nine o'clock service. Lot, everybody in the church. Where's Lynette at? Well, she she's she's off this weekend, so she's not going to be here till the eleven o'clock service. It's you know it, it's my weekend. Oh, we miss her when she's not you know. And so you know it's one it's one of them you know situations that you know do do we in our church you know on, on a personal level do we you know is it you know in any of our culture building because we do a journey. You know, we, we call it journey at, at our church that if you want to serve in any form of the ministry, it might be in security. It might be the praise and worship team, you know, the children's ministry. You know, we do go through, you know, what we call a journey. It's a three phase. It is really just filling you out what, what the church foundation was built on, what, you know, what, things, we, believe in. what we believe in and, and, you know, and stuff like that. I won't say like bylaws or anything like that because, you know, we, we, we do avoid the religion you know as far as the you know stuff stuff like that but you know there there's nothing that is you know as far as related to race and you, as you, far as race is you've been in the spirit or, James. or inequality or anything what, what did you say i said he's in the spirit because that was going to be my next question like does your church speak about injustice or deal with racial equality and things like that we do it there has been instances where it's been spoken about from the pulpit but here again i don't think we don't have it in our journey class because it's not the the experience Mm. so you know and and this is just like a hypothetical question like why would we talk about other races when there are no other races right you know, mm, yeah, so, yeah. I, it's, it's like one of those things of why are we? I don't need to talk about that because everybody that comes here looks like me. So why are we discussing it? So that's why it's not in our our journey. But our, our, our pastor has spoken about issues of race. And as you said, Antoine, before when he did and I never talked to you about this when he did, I, I was on the worship team that Sunday and I remember trying to not freeze because, you know, like. Sometimes my face, my face is not saved all the time. So I, I just, you know, I have to remember that it's not. So like, mm-hmm. either I look down. So if y'all ever watch our services and I'm looking down, something's happening. So I look mm-hmm. down and, and, or either, I just remember feel, that feeling of like, you know, that's how I felt. And so even though he was saying that we don't tolerate that, you know, he was, he was saying that that is unacceptable here. I just remember feeling like myself draw up because I was uncomfortable because I, I, even though I wanted him to say it, I didn't want him to say it because it just, I was like, Oh gosh, they're going to be looking at me. Like, I just felt like I was doing this. So he does, he does address it when it's something, um, it has been major though. It's major. It's not like there's not an issue. That's like a small thing. It, it, it was a major issue. But I feel like we should because we mm-hmm. do have visitors and we do have biracial children and it's just they're seen as black if they're biracial. So I feel like we should talk about it because as you said, April, most of the um, materials, they don't look like us, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. even though in the Bible, and I could be wrong, but it says burnt brass, lamb's wool. Like, yeah. Yeah. No, well. <laughs> So yeah, I didn't want to see this wool say. under here, honey. Book. <laughs> you know, that, that's what it said. Middle East, you know, that's that's not like a, a covered that's place. Bible. That's Bible. That's Bible. It's hot. You know, burnt grass is dark. So yeah. that's what we've explained to our children. But we don't have pictures because, you know, back in the day, we used to have pictures up in our houses. Our yeah. grandmas and everybody had the fans. Mm-hmm. And Jesus had long hair and looked like Robin Thicke did back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's what Jesus looked like. Blue you know, eyes. blue eyes, long hair, 
that mm -hmm. that side pose that was Jesus. Yeah. So you have to you have to make <laughs> it known in order to discuss it. And if you don't, if you skip around it, then nobody's going to talk about it. So if we're going to be biblical, we need to be biblical. And if we we talk about territory and logistics of things, even if we didn't have to be biblical, we have to talk about the logistics of where Christ was. Mm. You know, that would tell a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, it would be real hard for somebody to be fair skinned out there. It just would be, but that's another subject. I'm just saying we need to discuss it. We need to yeah. discuss it and it needs to be part of every church, even in the all black church. We mm -hmm. need to discuss it yeah. because there are more people like us and there are more people that don't, they want to, they want to be together. Why are we so segregated mm. in this hour? You know, yeah. you know that the church hour is the most segregated hour and it really is. It is. Mm -hmm. So we just need to talk about these things and feel uncomfortable in that moment of, <gasps> we just need to get past it and say, okay, we got to do it. We got to keep pushing. Because even Gina, though- Gina, what about, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I'm sorry, go ahead, James, I'm sorry. It, it, even though there may not be events or, or situations that take place related to you know, racism, whether it's you know, members of your church or leadership or in the community, just because it, it, it is something that you know, you're not hearing about or, or seeing doesn't mean it does not exist. So it, it's just right. one of the, it, it's just something that, okay, yeah, there, we may not be experiencing this because of where we live, you know, because we are 99% white. So there is going to be, there is, I mean, it's just a matter of stats. You're going to have less situations and less events take place of racism situations because you don't have, you know, a multicultural, yeah. but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Am I naive to think that I have, you know, family members, older generation family members, or friends, or people I hug and love at church that do, that does not have some form of racism in them, just because mm -hmm. they may not display it or, or expose themselves to us or to church, doesn't mean when they go to work on Monday with their coworkers, you know, that they, or were there with their family members, that they do that they yeah that, that, that they aren't racist they are they just aren't exposing it that's why the church needs to have that mm -hmm. in you know as be part of the church because it's one of them that we all can be whoever we want to be for 90 minutes on sunday come who on are we who are we yep. when we leave mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. it, it, you know the church needs to make that stance or you know as far as make that such an important piece because People may change. Because if I was raised, and we talked about it earlier, if I was raised and indoctrinated that, you know what? Black people are inferior. And I grow up thinking that my whole life. Mm. I, I may, I, it, it may be the church because I may have grown up in that, you know, exposed to that my whole life. It may be the church that breaks me. Come on. It wakes me up mm. and, and just tears that wall down in my heart and my mind that, you know what? No, I, I have been living a lie my whole life. This, mm. this is not how I should feel. And, and, you know, and just that, that's just, you know, where, where I feel, you know, as far as related to that. Bless it. Hey, hey Gina. Can, I, can I say something real quick? Can yeah, I say something real ahead. quick? Yeah. So it's, I think it's to Jane's point. So, um, and, and, and navigating these circles or navigating this thing, it's like, uh, no one wants to believe the average person, average church person. So language is important. So when you start off with, you know, racism, the first thing mo some people think of is oh, uh, the Klan, neo-Nazis. And so they <laughs> yeah. immediately dismiss, like, I'm not, I'm definitely not racist. Subtleties, okay, yeah. well, that's why I think the church is uniquely, um, it's uniquely equipped and designed to deal with it. Because remember, we're not saved because we're perfect. We're saved because we're sinners. Mm -hmm. So we don't. So when a person says, "Well, you know, I'm not racist. Yeah. I'm not, you know, da da da." Okay, let's just dig a little deeper because it's the little leaven that destroys the whole, yeah. the whole, the whole thing. So mm -hmm. there are things in my life that lead to that. So mm -hmm. if we don't address it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm. I would even give you this. I'd rather for you to address it 
and build up to it. I'd rather for you to begin, but even with the pastor, like it's going to be hard to address multicultural, multi-ethnic issues when all your friends look like you. Yeah. Like if yeah. you don't seek out understanding, mm -hmm. then you're going to be speaking from your own experience. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, my experience is, this is what my wife taught me. My wife taught me, um, stop trying to change how I feel. So if that's not what I meant to say, I'm trying to talk to Tanya about, uh, well, why you feel upset? Because that's not what I meant. I got yeah. to allow her to feel what she feel and stop right. trying to convince her. I, that's not what I mean. So sometimes in these circles, if I don't have the experience, then I don't feel qualified to speak on something that I don't have experience. But I was there when my wife gave birth. I don't want to give birth. I saw <laughs> it. <right? laughs> Mm. Yeah. I have to experience something to see it's painful it looked mm. painful so all I gotta do oh. is open up my dinner table open up and seek out there's a pastor that I know uh, from Pennsylvania and he literally sought out a um, white guy phenomenal guy um, he sought out churches watch this that didn't have his fundamental beliefs he sought out churches that didn't believe what he believed. He sought out pastors who didn't look like, um, like him to build relationships. So when I prayed to God, I want to see your kingdom, he, not, he didn't show me what I experienced. Mm. He put me in positions to see his kingdom, and his kingdom didn't look like Antoine. So I mm. think if a pastor is struggling with, okay, where do I start? It starts mm -hmm. with you and Jesus. Lord, mm -hmm. what's in my heart that won't allow me? I speak about money. I speak about this. I sp but that what's in my heart that won't allow me to speak on those things that I'm not comfortable with? And that's mm -hmm. why I think you got to start. Gina, that's, that's good, Antoine. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think is important for, for us as, as white people to understand, and uh, there's a new book out by um, a friend of mine that's called Rediscipling the White Church. And uh, I, think, I think that there's something, there's something very fundamentally wrong when we as white people, even if there's never a, uh, a black person, a Latino person, uh, an Asian American in our church, I think there's fundamentally something wrong if we never talk about racism even there because mm -hmm. racism as a demonic thing has negative effects on every single person that it touches. Mm. And yeah. when we are trying to be mature Christians, we become more mature when we dig into the sin. And again, this is the mm. sin of our forefathers. It's a sin of yeah. this nation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a sin that allowed us to kill tons of Native Americans yes. and, mm. and then allow us to build up a country on the backs of slaves. Um, this, this touches all of us. And if we think that we have to have someone in our congregation that looks different than us for us to even talk about this, there's something fundamentally wrong with that. And mm. we will never become mature Christians if we continue to think that way. And if we think that because that person's there, then we need to start talking about it. I'm not saying don't talk about it, but I'm saying if we if that's the thing that, that catalyzes us to do that, great, but we should have been doing it before. Because yeah. we become mature, we understand the gospel more, we understand who Christ is and who God is when we have more people at the table that don't look like us, because Anton's experience is very different than mine. And I don't know that side of Christ that he's got to tap into because of his experience. And that's really important for us, for us to understand and to get and to, to move with, I think. That's good. I'm sorry, you guys, oh, yeah. can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, thank you guys. I had something to say. Good. Yeah, go ahead. I, I'm sorry. April, I think you said you had something yeah. to say. Oh, yeah. I'm over here about to explode. I have, I've, I've been quiet for a whole hour. And I, <laughs> yeah, I was wondering why you were so quiet. Yeah, no, it was a good conversation. I didn't want to interrupt. And I wish I, James and Lynette kind of went off. But yeah, um, I'm hoping it did. I, I, 
I, I, so many things I wrote down notes. I, my experience is think is different from everybody else on this call. I do not go to a multicultural church. My church is entirely black, uh, including my, um, not just my particular church, but even my church, um, yay, my church um, <laughs> covered, my bishop and the church that I'm a part of collective is, I guess I can say I've seen maybe one white uh, woman that goes there occasionally and her daughter would be considered black as biracial okay so um oh keep going april okay all right <laughs> so so having that ex my experience where i don't go to a multicultural church but i i have so felt like that does not excuse me uh from being aware that it is important for me to have a relationship or at least talk about of yeah. the dynamic of of my white and black brothers and sisters in the church mm. or even outside of the church like yes there is racism because what one thing that can happen with the predominant black church or all black churches we can mm -hmm. talk on the other end of the spectrum yes. where the talk is more black panther ish and no, you know <laughs> and yeah. i don't want to say that you know that the pa black panther yeah. is all bad either i'm talking mm -hmm. about more like militant like you see how they treat us you see how they mm -hmm. and where we ostracize because gina is white even though she's christian that's why I don't even like that. I understand we have to categorize. I understand what you mean when you say white evangelical, but I feel like that's even a, a, a device of the devil where he doesn't draw a line in the body of Christ that the white Christians over there and black Christians over here and the mm -hmm. white Christians don't like us. And, you know, you know, us black people are just over here trying to defend ourselves. Um, but so many things when, when, um, James was talking, he was talking about his son and how he reacted to the child that was uh, bullying his son and actually got off the bus. And he didn't, he wasn't thinking about, oh, well, this might not look right and I need to kind of posture myself. He said that, I think he said something to the effect of, I did not want my son to have the testimony that my son didn't, when, it, when his son went through something, that my dad didn't take up for me. And mm -hmm. the thing is, mm -hmm. we're having this testimony. We're family. We are a body. We say we have one father, but we're having a testimony to the world that when one side of us get bullied, the other side don't take yeah. up. That's and good. Come on. Caring about how it looks. You no. know, so busy trying to pander to, I, I don't want you to think I'm liberal and I don't want you to think I'm too militant. Mm -hmm. but, but later for that, it, it's like I ride for my family. You know, right. I ride yeah. and, and and it don't matter. You can feel how you want to feel. We'll talk about yeah. it all niceties later. But when my my children or my mother, my father, my sister, my brother in law, whoever is in trouble, uh, we ride together yeah. and we'll discuss it afterwards. Yeah, right. And, 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 and kind of pan it all out, you know. And, and I wish that that would happen, that the testimony, uh, think about, and, and get me, y'all get me biblically right, but, but think about when Jesus was in the garden and um, even though he was, you know, uh, not chastised, but I think it was, wasn't it Peter who cut the soldier's ear off? Yeah, he was. Okay, so Peter, at that moment, it wasn't like, well, let me make sure, you know, I don't want to get arrested. He was like, hold up, you coming for Jesus I, now I got to hurt you. I don't care what right. you're doing. <laughs> mm, <yeah. laughs> you know, and, and, and just the sentiment of that. I wish that that would happen more in the body of Christ. And it is important just because, I, and, I, and, and this is blessing me, because even as I'm all going to an all black church, which are predominantly black covering, uh, you know, we don't teach, you know, white people are our enemy uh, by no means. And a lot of times when incidences happen in the news, we lean toward more making sure that, okay, we make sure we have the spirit of forgiveness. But then we can't just only say the whoever got affected, whoever was the victim, oh, make sure you forgive. But then we got to say, okay, those who were the assailants, make sure you're held accountable though. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, it's just so much. I don't want to take up, take up too, much, too much more time, but I just want to get that one point off. I think it's very important and I'm not excused I need to form relationships. I, I, I may, I don't know if my church will ever just get white members, but I can still go to the church that's right down the street and introduce myself. I can, I can find other Christian fellowships at least where we're fellowshipping, where we have a meal, you know, and I, I think that's important, but I love that, that what was brought out in that point of us just 
riding for each other. Yeah, that, that's a good point because I think I think it's a uh, you know when family talks about family, right? So mm-hmm. I think I think sometimes um, when we have these discussions. Uh, if I was, I'm on the outside looking in, if I'm a pastor, it's like, you know, there we go again. There we go again. The reason why we are passionate and the reason why we care is because we love the church. Like mm-hmm. we, we love God's people. We love, we, we still have that hope that's found in Christ. And so even times when I'm crying on my wife's lap again, because of the heartbreak that you see, I, even in this last incident, those two individuals, and I heard about the third individual, we still want the system to be fair to them. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's not a reaction to say, um, you know, let's do to them what they did to him. That's not what we're right, saying. Right, right. So we're literally saying is, listen, they deserve their day in court like he did. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and so sometimes when it comes to even police, man, we we have members of our church who are in the um in law enforcement. It's not about the police about justice being served so if if police are trained to act a certain way how am i held to a higher standard than the the police that's what Mm. we're asking for and i think sometimes when we have movements that are established to to attempt to right wrongs i think that's what it is so i'm not asking for my pastor friends on every single issue that happens they have a voice, but there are some issues that are in the fabric of this culture that we live in that needs more than a social media post. That Come needs on. more mm-hmm. than a tweet. You don't pacify me because you tweet. You don't pacify me. That's not what, what it is. So I think what I wanted to get out of this podcast is to, is to, is to get us to a place that we are having the conversation. So these conversations can be in the church. These conversations can be directed yeah. from the pulpit. At the end of the day, the beauty of the cross is the fact that he brings us all together. Mm-hmm. So it's like what April said. It's like I ride for my family. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't I don't when when things happen, I don't go to the streets to see what the street feels or the world. I want to go to my family. I want to be able to look at James and Lynette and not have to say a word, but to hold them in that moment. That is what I think is driving me personally to become more vocal. Because Mm -hmm. maybe as I wait for them to stand up, the burning and the ignition that's in my heart is for me to stand up. So Mm. whoever whoever will listen, so I don't want to alienate the people that I serve. I don't want to alienate my colleague. But at some point, I get invited, and we should. I'm mm-hmm. against abortion. I get invited. But how about being invited to the table to discuss injustice? Yeah. Why, mm. How about getting invited to places that you are not comfortable with? Mm-hmm. How about getting invited mm. now where we, you don't offer the answers. You just offer an ear. And mm. that is what I think the shifting of the dynamic has to be. If I, if we, if we don't praise him, the rock's going to cry out. Yeah. So yeah. if we don't cry out for justice, then the world's going yeah. to justice. Yeah, they and I think pick that's it up. where the point of this discussion. Yeah. Because here's what Lynette and James have done for me. Now I see the children in our congregation who are biracial, now I see it differently. Mm. But if we don't have the conversation, we don't have awareness. And awareness should lead to action. And that's all it is. Become aware of it so it leads to action. Yeah, Amen. and I just want to just piggyback off what he was saying. I, I definitely feel like we should have town hall meetings, like in our churches. Like, I don't understand what we're so afraid of. The word of God declares that the righteous are bold as a lion. Where's our boldness? You know, mm-hmm. why do we shrink back when it comes to issues, especially that pertain to, you know, s- things such as racial um, justice and things that would uh, keep us separated, you know, but if we decide discuss it, it would bring us closer, you know, and and I I just feel like, you know, sometimes we feel like, like,
like, um, you know, you'll hear certain people say, well, I'm not racist. I'm not racist. There, there is no way you can grow up in this society and not be affected in some way by mm -hmm. the images that we are bombarded with that mm -hmm. show people of color in inferior in inferior positions. There is no way, whether you were raised as, you know, racist or, or not, there's still those, like he was talking about, those little foxes that spoil the vine that, that shape our perspectives, that shape the way that we view things. So I really feel like definitely having more of these conversations, bringing them to the table and not being afraid because the world the world ain't afraid but when they speak of it it's it's not going to be with love it's going to be right. like one on one side or on the other so it's important for the church to bring a more balanced approach to uh discussing race and discussing racial justice so and i April, think oh go ahead jenna april i loved your um your image of you know what james did as you know this is this is what we can do as a church, right? Um, I'm going to be thinking about that for a long time. Um, and and James, I just wanted to to kind of push back on something you said. You said that that what you were doing, you know, at the moment was not what Jesus would do. Um, and I think that um, uh, one of the one of the quotes that I hang on to, especially in these these times right now, is is um, Pope has two daughters their anger and courage. And, um, and I think that, you know, a lot of times in growing up in, in predominantly white spaces in Christianity, uh, the idea and the mentality is that Jesus would never do something like that. Mm. But as April put it together, that's exactly what we need to be doing, right? Wow. Um, and I think, I think one of the things that we don't often talk about is that child that you talked to, that you went directly to, you were in that moment, elevating his Imago day too, because you mm -hmm. were saying, no, you need to be accountable for what you've done. This is not okay. We will not accept this in our society. This is not okay. And sadly, if we think about that whole picture in a bigger picture, sadly, there are going to be churches who are going to be like the principal and his dad and, and people who are, who have been part of the church for a long time, who are going to say, nope, that's not how we do this. What you did was wrong. You should not do that, James. But no, that's not the truth. Mm -hmm. The truth is that if we are not going to hold up our own people to do these things and be intentional about telling them that racism is demonic, then someone who is immediately affected by it is going to come in and tell them that racism is demonic and they need to hear it, whoever it's coming from. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Um, Could I say one more thing? Yeah. I just, because we haven't mentioned it before, but until we found our church home here, and I think this is something that needs to be thought about in churches all over America. We have been, we've been in the situation where we went to a church before we found our home and had the look. So I think we need to make sure that as people, as Christians, as, as church people, we need to look at love and not at our skin color because we walked in together and it was like time stopped. We didn't mm. attend that church after that day. But these are things that we need to think about too, that these I, we could have been non-believers and that could have completely mm. turned us away from yeah. Christ. So we just have to be careful um, in any church. It doesn't matter predominantly white, predominantly black. When you see people that are different than you physically, we have to speak to their spirit and not to their physicality because we don't want to turn anyone away from the love of Christ because we're not showing it. Mm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I think somebody yeah. mentioned it. And hello. Oh, I think somebody mentioned it. And I think we can kind of segue. Um, I'll say this, and then we can kind of go into the question and answer. Um, April brought this up when we were discussing this topic, and I think it's good. And James kind of talked about it when he was talking about the journey class that you that your church takes I guess it kind of sounds like a new members but we were talking about that there needs to be conversations that are surrounding mm -hmm. um cultural competency 
within our new members gathering when we're teaching on this is who we are as a church this is what we believe we believe that you know jesus the son of christ we believe in the death to burial when we're going through those tenets of what that looks like i think we do need to start adding those cultural competency components to our church uh uh I don't want to say bylaws, but the undergirding of what that church represents, whether it's a predominantly Caucasian church or predominantly black church, because it's everywhere and we're all being impacted. And so I think that that is something that um, something that I feel like really needs to take place within, you know, churches at large. Um, especially churches at large in America, because these are very real realities mm -hmm. that are taking place and we have to lead and we're not leading that conversation and, and our voices are being taken away from us. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. this is awesome that we all came together and everyone didn't know one another and we were having this conversation, but it does go back to that dinner table and that intentionality that, you know, all has spoken of. So at this time, I know that we're live on Facebook um, and I just wanted to know if there were any people watching or anyone watching, if they had any comments or questions for our special guest that they would like to um, ask. And I think Holly and um, April can have access to that to kind of um, ask those questions if there are any. I had a question. Um for Lynette and her husband, James. So how did you guys as families accept your relationship? Like when you kind of went home to meet them for the first time and that sort of thing, how was that dynamic? <laughs> well, uh, we, you know, we met in college, like she said earlier, 98. And so, make it uh, <laughs> okay. So <laughs> obviously, you know, tw 22 years later, everything is different. And, and it was, you know, early on it was as well, but the, the, the greatest experience was not at the time, but Lynette and I had started dating in, in college, you know, uh, in 98. And so her mom knew that she had started dating a guy and he was white, but her dad at the time knew that she was talking to a guy talking, not talking dating. <laughs> and seeing a guy his name was james that's it so mm -hmm. she had a home volleyball um uh, match and so i got out of basketball conditioning went straight to the gym she finishes it up because my parents came to every game yes. so this is why this is important so okay. <laughs> after the game is over with uh came out of the bleachers, I'm talking to Lynette and her mom, to Doki. And so her dad went to use the restroom and then came up and when he walked up, you know, uh, just walked up and Lynette goes, dad, this is James. And then you could see that. Did I say that? Yeah, this is James. And you could see <laughs> that kind of like, okay, let me, let me process this and realize, <laughs> oh, this is James. <laughs> And the James. the James, and he just kind of looked and he turned around and walked away. But wow. <laughs> that, was, that was my first. His first, and James, and so James had his hand out. Mm -hmm. And my daddy was like, oh, okay. And he, I put, I, I, I put my hand out, nice to meet you, sir. And he, he said, not today. He turned Ooh. around and walked away. And walked <laughs> so that was all. <laughs> So, because, okay, let me preface all of this. Okay, my parents are 10 years apart. My mom and dad, so they grew up in different generations. My daddy grew up in segregation. Or, no, no, no. He grew up, um, yes, segregation. So he went to an all-black school, you know, the whole shebang. My mom was in a um, integrated school. Mm -hmm. So, all of that background, my dad, we've always had good relationships with all, all cultures. But I am an only child. My 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 parents' only child and my daddy's only daughter, only child, only daughter. So any man that I was gonna date, that's an issue because I'm his baby. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, he would always tell me growing up, you know, love everybody, just be careful. So <laughs> then we find out that baby girl is with this James, <laughs> not James and James, like James, James. Paul, okay. <laughs> 
it was a shock. <laughs> I mean, oh, my daddy was like, mm -mm. he loved mm -hmm. him. And as our as our relationship progressed, we when when they would have conversations, like before we even talked about getting married, my daddy would be like, so y'all, he would tell James, are you ready to have kids? Like, can you take care of, because you know, your kids are going to be mixed, because we didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he was like, your kids are going to be mixed. So do you know? Are, are you ready to are you, are you sure you want to do that because you know your kids are going to have some issues yes. you know and i say and you know it was just that conversation but you know to be totally you know as far as two totally different individuals obviously totally different generations to to over you know a six month to a year period of us dating and where they were just 45 minutes 50 minutes away from campus you know, we would meet them halfway. We would meet in Shelby, you know, so we could hang out and eat, go to the mall. That, mm -hmm. you know, of finding so much similarities between us when we were obviously two totally different mm -hmm. men. men they, like, they took care of him because he was eight hours from home. So even if we were, when we started dating for real, this is how I knew it wasn't like, it was kind of a color issue because his parents were fine with it. It was like, okay, she's black, whatever. My daddy had the issue. Okay. But how we knew it wasn't an issue, we were, we were broken up at one point. And I remember, because you know Gaffney, the, the, the outlets in Gaffney? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's 15 minutes from Gardner Webb. I remember mom and daddy was like, we're going to come pick you up. We're going to take you shopping. So I'm like, oh, okay. Well, they rolled down to my dorm and we picked <laughs> me up. And then, because I'm single at the moment, then mm -hmm. we roll around to loops was it loops mm -hmm. and we pick him up and i'm like what are we doing and we're not even together they were like we take we taking him shopping too so like okay. my daddy would take him to AutoZone and get stuff for his car because he was eight hours from home mm -hmm. so what we found out later my daddy was like i don't have an issue with the the color so much as i don't want him to ever be faced with the choice mm -hmm. of choosing him or choosing you and your children because of your color. Mm -hmm. Because he said, at some point, you may be faced with, you have to fight because they're with you. And he said, I would never want anybody's child to have to go through that. Mm -hmm. So I don't want my daughter to have to go through it, but I definitely don't want him to have to make that choice of me or my family. Because he knows, he knew James was yeah. a good provider. He knew he was a good person because otherwise, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have dealt with him outside of us dating. They mm -hmm. loved him because they knew he was eight hours from his family. If he needed money, if he needed stuff, clothes, my parents were taking care of him. So wow. I think it was my daddy just knew. He, he was like, I've been on buses when they threw bottles at us. Mm -hmm. And they spit at us to go to school. I've, I've dealt with people treating me bad because I'm a big black man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... I know that feeling and I don't want someone else's child to have to go through that and then take care of my child. So that was his thing gotcha. was, you know, he was more concerned about after we got past the initial shock of James, <laughs> he was just more concerned about how was he ready to take mm -hmm. care of the family mm -hmm. and take mm -hmm. that weight on as a man because he knew what type of man he was. Mm -hmm. And he, he was basically, are you ready to lay down your life basically? If you have to make that choice, but wow. it, it worked out. Yeah, and, and you know, it was it, it was the a situation where, you know, for me, you know, I easily could have just been okay. This is what I want to spend the rest of my life with, and I am going to make a conscious effort to impress her dad to to <laughs> win him over to want him you know, to like me and accept me. And, and, and I never did change. Cha cha I never did do that. And, and I'm so, and I'm so thankful and blessed that I, I was strong enough to be like, you know what? He, he's going to accept me on his own terms, not because I'm changing mm -hmm. to be, you know, an individual that he thinks I should be, you know, because I can't change the color of my skin, but yeah. you know, we, we both love muscle cars, you know, him talking about all of his, you know, Mustangs and Mach 1s. And here I am in college and I got a 68 Camaro Super Sport 396. And he's just like, <laughs> he's like, what are you doing with a, a 1960s vehicle? And this is 1999 and 2000. So wow. we have so much similarities. And, you know, for my side, I never tried to, you know, 
you know, you know, push anything or, or like, you know, like I said, that you're, you're going to, you know, you're going to see me as an individual that, you know, loves sports, loves your daughter, works his butt off. And I don't do, I don't change who I am just to try to, you know, as far as fitting with the family or, or the mold of that you want me to be. And then like she said, with my family, we have been dating a couple months. My freshman year, my parents are getting ready to make that drive to come down to Midnight Madness because I played basketball in college. And I talked to my dad. I'm like, hey, I'm actually dating a girl. He's like, okay. And I said, you know, she's athletic. She plays <laughs> sports. She's beautiful. Okay, <laughs> okay. And, and I said, you know, and she's black. And I paused. <laughs> and he, and uh, so I'm on the phone with him and he goes, are you waiting for a response or, or what? Oh, and I'm like, well, wow. I, just, I just didn't want you to be blindsided. And he was like, you know, and I know we talk about don't see, you know, colors, but my dad used, and, and I use this today and I, I say it all the time. He on the phone in that conversation, he said, son, it doesn't matter if you're purple and she's green. Love should have no color. It truly should not have any color at all. As long mm. as you love each other, take care of each other, in in any aspect of your life love has no color and that does just mean you know as far as in love with each other just love in general and i and that was all that was the only time in my life with my dad or my parents or my mother mm -hmm. that there was a discussion about race wow. and you know the, and it was just i'm dating a girl and she's black and that was the only conversation and the only response i got from him was James, it, it, it's if you're asking for my <laughs> approval or acceptance, you, there's there's no issue on our part. Don't worry about that. You know, again, love has no color, and, and I and that just stuck with me. You know, and then trying to, you know, put that down with the kids, you know, and stuff as well. So that's it. That's wow. all. <laughs> that's awesome. <I> <laughs> Yay! Awesome! Wow. Okay, and I had a, another question. I'm sorry, I'm asking all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> all the same game in there yet, so I'm gonna ask. Them. So, Gina, like, did you, whenever you went into this space as it relates to, um, you know, racial inequality, um, as it relates to the the the, let me see, how can I phrase this, the, the black experience? Were you faced with any um, hesitancy? Mm -hmm from us as it relates to being someone white coming into mm. to advocate for us like were there any oh i want to hear this <laughs> <laughs> oh that's a good question um so prior to landing at the kingdom <clears throat> um we had visited uh, i think it was two other churches two other black churches um and the first one that we went to um, was a more traditional, um, I think it was a Lutheran church, and we had just heard really good things about this particular pastor, um, and when we went, uh, it was very cold. We were not received well at all, um, and you know, at the time, I think it was like right after the year, the anniversary of, of what happened in South Carolina, um, um at the church yeah. there. And so Andrew and I, afterwards, we talked about it and I was like, you know, there's no way to know what's going on in other people's minds. And the coldness mm -hmm. that we feel could simply be, well, is this going to be another Dylan roof, you know? And, mm -hmm. and, and that's a very justifiable response to have to mm -hmm. a random white family that shows up in church. Uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's a reality. Um, but it also it also made uh, quite a big difference when we walked into Think Kingdom and just immediately felt <laughs> so, so very welcomed. <laughs> so welcomed. Um, wow. It was definitely more our style of church, I would say, in general. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, I think Antoine, I think we talked to you for like two hours after church that day or something. <laughs> I don't know, but it was, I mean, it was a quick. Yeah, it was funny that the, the first time we met, 
Um, I found I found immediately Gina's heart because I mm. can't remember what we were talking about, and um, she she became she she cried at at something that was dear to my heart. It was a, I think I can't I think you're right. It was at the Dylan Roof thing, and then um, it was crazy because sometimes I kid with Gina that she's more black than I am. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, so sometimes, like, when we talk about issues, I, I, it's like I'm passionate, right? But it's like one of those things, like, I'm contemplative, and she's getting mad, man, and she's like, <laughs> and I, I would often say to her, like, dude, you more mad than I am. <laughs> <laughs> what you mean? But I think we've had hard conversations. We we didn't we don't agree on everything. It, 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 that's not. The, the, the means of relationship and I think if anybody could gather anything from this it's the relationship piece it's that the relationship has to be strong enough to leave room for offense and I think mm. if Christ brings mm. us together yeah. if Christ truly brings us together it's like I argue with my brother and sister all the time we still family right right so I think that's I think that's the core I think when these instances or incidents happen it shows us that we're not really a part of the same family. Mm. That's the mm. indictment. The indictment mm. is mm. that mm. I can listen mm. to people and not feel what they feel because I don't have the experience. That's that's mm. crap. I can yeah. listen to you mm. and not have that experience and still mourn that experience with you. That's I, right. I don't, mm. I don't have to have the answers. But do you think that that's what they meant? Who cares? This is how I feel. Mm. I think right. that's where we really have to get the dialogue. And honestly, I appreciate you guys, um, the Truth Reveal host, uh, mm -hmm. because you're leaning into hard spaces. Um, yeah. I appreciate mm -hmm. Lynette and James for just sharing mm -hmm. like your experiences because that put a whole different dynamic on it. That here's yeah. a husband that wants to feel his wife's pain, but also knows his limitations on it. That's a different mm -hmm. dynamic. Um, yeah. with, with Gina and her leaning into hard spaces, recognizing that I mourn and I weep yet I may not have those experiences, but she wants to learn and grow. I think that's that's what we should be doing. I think we yeah. should have conversations all the time. I'm not saying come to my church during Black History Month. I'm not saying that. I'm saying right. let's walk together yeah. all the time. And so yeah. I want to have friends who, I got this friend, and shout out to him, Jeff Smith. And um, Cowboy Church, and we're polar Cowboy opposites. Cowboy Church, <laughs> yeah, we just we just completely opposites. But um, <laughs> one of the things that he said to me, which was crazy, it's that there was an incident that happened in Charlotte, and he said, you know, I don't want to offend you, I don't want to do any of that, but I want to know, man, you can't offend mm. me wanting to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you offend me when you don't care to know. And mm. that's what the offense comes Oh, that's good. Mm. Mm. That's good. Mm. That's I very good. good. I have a question. If we Go ahead, April. One from the, mm -hmm. Okay. I, I'm directing this at, uh, at Pastor Lassiter, at Antoine. Uh, when it comes to having a multicultural church or being a multicultural pastor, okay, I, I'll say some of the angst that I hear. When it comes to, I guess, being intentional about making your church multicultural a lot, I don't say a lot, but some some of people of color feel like we end up having to assimilate or get whitewashed mm. or take our culture and put it up Phew. underneath the seat when it's time to merge with uh, our our white brothers and sisters. Yeah. So we resist it because oh, there's a level. And let me expose April. myself. Let me stop this general, uh, for me, That's good. I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, it's like, it, it's mm. very comfortable for me to be in an all black space, not because mm. I don't love my brother and sister, don't want to learn from them, but I can talk about something in a way that I would have to guard my words and mm. watch kind of how I, I, I am or think that, oh, I don't want to be too much of that around my white brother and sister. So, so, so mm. can you speak to that, Pastor Lasseter? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, that's, that's a very good mm, question yes. and I'm not going to give you a political answer. I'm just going to give you my heart. So, um, I, I grew up in a country, rural, small, where across the street was a tobacco field. And when I got into middle school, uh, I was in white spaces. I was the minority in the sense of, because it, they labeled things in terms of academics. And then when I got in high school, 
Um, I was in predominantly white classes um, and I had uh, my homeboys um, that sort of kept me grounded. And then I went to an HBCU and then I, I grew up in the black church and then I stumbled into white churches. So mm. I've always had to navigate these spaces. So the, if you look at my Spotify playlist, it's all types of music. So I did run into wanting to fit in. And so I will, accentu I will accentuate parts of my blackness mm. to fit in with my black friends. And then when I had white friends, I would accentuate my um, whiteness. So I, 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 I moved in these circles. And then I just realized that um, even when I were in the so-called predominantly black churches, I realized I was different. That, um, mm. that like my case, my taste in comedy is different. Mm. Like it's, it, and so, so I started accepting my difference. So when I became comfortable with my difference, I became comfortable with my approach. Once I became comfortable with my approach, it's like people wanted an authentic me. So mm. it's not me trying to navigate these circles and making sure that I speak the King's English. It's this is who I am. And so yeah. um, I had to deal with tokenism. I talked to my friends about it, like mm. that I don't represent all blackness. We are not homogenous. Mm. We so mm -hmm. so I'm it's not that I'm articulate. It's not no, I am who I am. So when I when I navigate these circles, I'm really saying this is who I am. So when I first merged, I was the politician. I was meeting people. I didn't want to offend people. And I, I, mm. I tiptoed around so many issues. But then I realized that that the people who know me, the people who know how I love they extend grace with people who don't know me. There's nothing mm. I can do. I can, I can do circus tricks. I can do backflips. They will walk away and still um, complain about me. So what I realized was, okay, God, who do you say that I am? It's mm. not in my crowd. It's not in my blackness or my whiteness. I recognize that these things are sort of components. But my DNA is beyond my race. My DNA mm. is Come beyond on, my rule setting. My DNA is beyond that. So I mm. like what I like. So when Gina and Andrew moved, um, moved, they were my close friends. Now, I enjoy the, 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 the cultural uh, differences and being wise. But what I, all, what I enjoy more so than that was our relationship. So... When I walk into circles now, because I know who I am, I don't have to flop to my blackness. I don't have to deny that I'm white. I don't have to deny any of that. I am who I am, but in able to navigate those circles, and this is what I would like to say to pastors, be who you are. You don't have to talk black to be relatable. We want mm. you to be authentic. We want Amen. you to be you. So you don't have to come up with the answers. You don't have to say that you had a black girlfriend in college. You, you don't have to share all that. Just be who you are. You don't have to be anything other than how God created you. But he also created us with our differences. So mm. it's like I yes. tell my son. It's like I give them the reality surrounding the cases and everything that happens. But my hope is not in the justice system. My hope mm -hmm. is not in police office. My hope is in Jesus Christ. So I yes. have to balance all of this. And so when I look at, I think, some of our friends, uh, our members, when I look at the Jennifers, the Debras, um, the Garys, who's a 61-year-old white guy, who's like my right-hand man, it's like mm -hmm. those relationships are contrary to what's norm because we decided we're gonna think kingdom. We're gonna see our truth mm. like like the kingdom. And so yeah. we do navigate sometimes with okay, uh the songs and 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 the preferences, but preferences never trump relationship. Mm. So what we gotta understand about our church is we allow room to step on each other's toes. Some people have said some of the most ignorant things to me mm -hmm. and I had to chalk it up as they didn't know better. Mm -hmm. So when people were categorizing like, well, how do you preach? What do you mean? Um, mm -hmm. how, like the you, when you <laughs> preach, um, like, how, and I'm just waiting, I'm just quiet and I'm gonna make them say, 
<laughs> like I'm going to make because I understand what they're saying. Their cultural experience yeah. with black churches is the hoop. Mm-hmm. And so those mm-hmm. are the things that I honestly try to embrace, but I could only embrace that when I became comfortable with who I am. Mm-hmm. Gina does not try to be anybody else except Gina. Yeah. James and Lynette only has to be mm. James and, and, and Lynette. Don't be anybody else. So allow that space, man. And I think that's a long answer to your question. But it's just being comfortable <laughs> yeah. with who you are and, and not leading with your Blackness. It's leading mm. with your humanity. So I mourn mm. with, with that. So I don't make apologies for African Americans who rob people and don't make apologies for the the, the, the white individuals who killed them. That, that's not mm. what this is. I'm saying mourn through your humanity. So mm. I want justice impute upon all races at all times. What I struggle with is when we try to figure out what happened before we figure mm. out our own Come humanity. On. That's what I have issues with. I have issues when we pretend that the sickness of sin cannot invade our country. What? I, I have issues with when we talk about how demonic sin is, but uh, that's not what this issue is. I, I have issues when we recognize on one hand that we're imperfect people, but somehow the system is supposed to be perfect. See, I have issues with that. Mm. Those are copies. Mm, 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 what we got to do is dig deeper into it. Mm. Yes, good, good, good. Well, amen. Preach it, preach it. <laughs> I always need, a, I always need a notebook when I'm around Anton, so I can I'm take notes. You. <laughs> hey, that real, t- real talk. I appreciate that because this is for my heart, and this is what uh, Gina did for me. Um, Jennifer wow. just texted me, asked me what's a hoop. I, I'll talk about that oh. later. <laughs> but, oh, <laughs> um, Gina will, Gina. <laughs> Gina would ask me tough questions that I had to lean into. And mm. the problem that I was suffering from was, was literally trying to be all things to all people mm-hmm. while losing myself. Mm. And that is what, if, if we're not careful, mm. uh, the, the scripture speaks of, be careful, of, um, don't be afraid of men in their faces. Because sometimes we have, uh, we respond based on how people look. So mm-hmm. if you lean into hard issues and you got like you, you and you got that response, quick story. So I'm I'm preaching at the cowboy church and uh man, I'm preaching and I'm preaching about Jacob and no, I'm preaching about Joshua and it's a very familiar text. And this old white guy was sitting in the back and he was frowning like this. And so the more he frowned, the harder I preach. <laughs> I was, I was, I was pulling out scripture and I was just saying, because I already believed that, okay, these people are not going to accept me. So I came with a chip on my shoulder. So I'm going to preach Jesus. I'm going, and so I kept preaching and preaching and preaching. And the whole time he was just standing like this. And so finally, at the end of the service, his son walks up to me and he whispers in my ear. He said, my dad says, you're one of the greatest preachers he ever preached that, that he ever heard. Wow. And his father had a stroke. And his and it, it paralyzed oh, his wow. face. So while mm. I was reading him like he was doing this. Oh my goodness. He had a stroke. And I realized that here I am preaching mm. the gospel with a chip on my shoulder, judging mm. them, judging them. Yeah. Like I thought my they were judging God. me. Yeah. So I'm mm. telling y'all, it's the gospel that did that. And so, mm. and here's another caveat. His son had the, the Confederate flag tattooed on his forearm. Mm. His son had a t-shirt with the Confederate flag that said, these colors don't run. I had to look past that mm. and still had to see the Imago day in this family in spite of how that made me feel. So mm. don't tell me that the cross and the gospel is not enough. But what we oh got to do is get out of this, these, these categories, get out of this premise that self-preservation becomes the law of the land. We have to live our gospel out. 
and we have mm. to lay down our lives for the gospel's sake for people who might call me a name. And that's the sake of the mm. gospel. So think about Dr. King. When Dr. King died, he didn't die just for blacks. He died yeah. for the, the unity of humanity. And so what we keep rehearsing in our minds are the differences. So here's what I just want to leave with. The differences are diverse. It's, it's, it's like God's tapestry. The differences, mm. the mm. colors, it's like the multiple colors of flowers. It speaks truth and it speaks power and it shows diversity. And so here's the issue. The issue is if I only speak from my experience, I limit the gospel. So I have mm. to open my pulpit to people who don't look like me, who Ooh. don't think like me. I have to open my pulpit and we have to stop raising, raising banners of beliefs that I'm concerned about what Gina's doctrine is and not concerned about her heart, not concerned about mm. love. And if we don't get past that, then what the world does is exploit. What the world does and what the media does is exploit. So they exploit the differences for selfish gain. I yeah. love reading separated by the border because I'm a mm. part of that story. Not because I'm in the book. It's because I had influence on them and they had influence on me. I love hearing Lynette and James. Now I'm a part of that story because mm. now when I see a, a multiracial, a, a biracial child, I understand now having not experienced it, but now it's like, okay, wow, think about what, what challenges they may have. I love hearing what the women have to, I told Sweet this, and I'm gonna shut up, I promise you, <laughs> that my issue is that, that I can't speak to women issues, but I can, I, can under, I can walk with you, I can stand with you, because even though I don't have the experience, doesn't mean the issue don't exist. And so what mm -hmm. happens when I don't have that experience, when I don't have that, when that's not in my purview, what ends up happening is I become dismissive. That's not how the church is. Mm -hmm. that's, not mm -hmm. how, that's not what our intentions are. And because I want an echo chamber and I don't want different voices. And so what we have to do as the people of God is to allow the different voices to speak, to, to allow the stumbling of our faith, allowing the hard questions. What do I think about this? Most of us who are Christians had one question after we saw our selfishness and we are, we saw our sin. What must we do to be saved? Mm -hmm. So if I if my sin is exposed, I don't run. I want no matter what my children do, I want my children to run to me. Yeah. So if mm -hmm. if, if racism exists in my heart and I'm and and and, and, and God the Father. Father's response to us is to run to us, mm -hmm. to run to me. So if, if I'm listening and I got racism in my heart, prejudice in my heart that doesn't honor the image of God in people, mm -hmm. I'm not asking you to be shameful. I'm asking you to be convicted by the Holy Spirit and run yeah. to God. Because yeah. if all have sin, it's not beyond reason that some in the church is dealing with the sin of racism. Mm -hmm. If all have sin, it's not beyond reason that some in the church are dealing with sexism. And so what we have yeah. a tendency to do is because we don't deal with it, we don't speak about it. We don't speak yeah. about it. And how can they hear if we don't mm. preach? And how yeah. can they preach if they're not sent? We are mm -hmm. sent to proclaim the gospel, but it's not just good news in the sense of saving me from sin. The better news is saving me the sin that I deal with. So Lord, mm. help me to grieve the sin that's in my own heart and help me to deal with the sin that comes against me. So when a racist is racist, demonic, that sin, I grieve mm. because it makes me feel bad. I grieve because he's a lost soul. And mm. that's what we got to get back to. The reason why we speak truth is fair not is because we are supposed to be agents of change. So yes. it's not it's not burying yeah. it. It's not pretending it don't exist. It's actually going into those hard places, mm -hmm. being accused of being a social justice warrior, being accused of being this in this camp and this camp. But here's the question I have asked for anybody. When was the last time you seen and felt good about it? So maybe mm -hmm. the reason why you don't want to talk about it is because you want to deal with your own sin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My yeah. Lord. Yeah. Shoo. Good. <laughs>
Do we have any questions from um I Facebook? I've asked these jokers several times. It ain't nobody seen me. <laughs> no, 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 they no questions. No, I, no I questions. Last call. Questions. Last call for questions. <laughs> I feel I feel like shouting, and I don't mean hollering, shouting in the Honey. like in my feet. <laughs> in your feet, <laughs> feel like dancing. Where's the somebody, well, cause, cause somebody, we had one question that was sent to me privately, but I left her, so I called her out. Jennifer. So ah. uh, she asked, what's, what's the hoop? Oh, <laughs> somebody <laughs> outside of me, somebody outside of me, uh, answer that question, please. I'm just messing with you, Jennifer. April, you. you're a minister. <laughs> define define okay, hoop. I'm, I'm, I'm going to define hoop to the best of my ability. It's a cadence of preaching where you rhythmically preach and you can either make a I say like an ad lib or a, a or a gas it's I hate to try uh -huh. to do it Help me. do it, it. Do it. <laughs> demonstrate <laughs> demonstrate I'm it's a visual gone. learner Three. I need to hear it <laughs> Uh -huh. it's, it's audio. Three, six, it's a little, I can't hoop. That's the thing. I'm a black girl and I can't hoop. Okay. <laughs> Holly, uh, Holly's look, a but, minister. Who? Somebody. It's the ha and a ha and the Lord said ah. And the, you know, and this ah. Uh, and uh, it's like a, a breath that you add to every. <laughs> And it's in a rhythm. Yeah, it's in you a know rhythm. what I'm saying? You can take your, take your, in, in John. Three sixteen, huh? Well, uh -huh. yeah. Well, said, <laughs> that he will, you know. <laughs> you know how to hoop. You know how to hoop. You know how to hoop. Oh, he a line on Facebook. I didn't uh, see. <laughs> mm. Yes, oh uh, that's gosh. that's part of that, and I loved what um just just in that you know we lighthearted, but the. I love what Pastor Lassiter said about not putting culture, <laughs> uh, not not uh, putting your culture above your humanity or above the yeah. Christianity. You know, we are gathered together by the blood of Jesus, and I think even me, I got, I got, I, I can't just make it general. I gotta say, even me, I've allowed. I think uh, the influence of where I live, America, mm -hmm. living in America. Growing up in America has allowed me to allow me to be somewhat influenced to heighten the level of importance of my skin color. Now, mm -hmm. I, I, I totally believe in, yes, Stephen, God made me brown and it's beautiful. God made my hair more tightly curled or kinky or whatever. That's beautiful. So please see me just like I love golden hair and blue eyes and brown hair. And, you know, so, you know I love all of it. So they did not see me, mm -hmm. but that doesn't make me more than you or less. Yeah. But yeah. I think that what happens is uh, the church got really heavily influenced. And I mean, we're people we, before, mm -hmm. before we come into Christ, we're in this world, you know, yeah. And we're born into sin, you know, shaped in iniquity. So um, it's a thing of unlearning, uh, un mm. unlearning that even in the negative sense where black people will think that you are, that I am less than and mm -hmm. that I, I do need to change myself to be accepted or to be considered correct or right. So I, I, I just love this conversation. And like I said, mm. I feel like shouting. Hey, <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, <laughs> you guys, man, man, man. It has Did we been talk so for three good. hours? Uh, almost. Uh, well, let me see. Wait, about, yeah, almost. Two, yeah, yeah. So I, Let's first see. of all, want to say, like, sincerely, Thank you, thank you, thank yes, you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you. This conversation would not have had the same thank color yes. to it if it didn't have three people that were represented. Um, each of you guys came came and come from a different experience. And that's what that's what makes it so good. They were all, all of us, all six. Seven of us are all coming from different experiences, different walks of life, different backgrounds. And the thing that April just said that ties us together is the blood of Jesus. And I think this is the kingdom. This is what the kingdom looks like. It's, it's men, women, yeah. um, black, white, Hispanic, Native American, whatever. It's that, that difference coming together. So I am so so appreciative and you know i speak on behalf of holly and um, april as well to say we thank you guys thank so, you much. so much and we do not take it lightly um we just want to end by just having um all of our guests 
just give us a lasting thought, a, a quick lasting thought. Um, uh, what is the last thing that you want people to remember? A quick, a quick lasting thought. Uh, I'm past the last thing. You said it. It's hard to learn. <laughs> you know, I know you're talking about beat. Look. Uh, so everybody on here likes to talk. I already know. If we all get around a dinner table, it's going to be all good. <laughs> but just whatever you guys want um, to be your last thing comment. And we'll just go Gina, Lynette, James, Antoine, Holly, April, and then I'll end it out. So Gina, last words and thoughts for the audience. So um, I was recently looking over um, uh, King's letter to Birmingham jail again, and where it, he talks about the white moderate. Um, one of the things he says is that um, you have prioritized order over justice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really stuck with me this week as I read it and um, just trying to think through in what ways am I prioritizing order over justice. Um, and mm -hmm. I think uh, if we are not intentional uh, as white moderates, if, if we are not intentional, we will continue to prioritize order over justice to mm -hmm. the detriment of our witness of the church of our brothers and sisters. And so I hope and pray that we will learn how to not do that. Amen. Mm, amen. James Lynette. You can go first. Let me go first. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, j just, you know, an ending, you know, statement or, or anything would, you know, when we started it off with, you know, as far as being, you know, a, um, having, you know, biracial kids, you know, as far as being a parent, you know, as far as for me, we, you know, with our son, Jameson, you know, you can, you know, we all read a, a different stuff. It's like, okay, when you've got, you know, biracial children, how, how do you raise them to learn or em, em, embrace both sides, the, the, the Caucasian side and the black side? So it, it, for my side, you know, that I don't know that there is in my, in my position to try to raise my son and teach him the, the, you know, characteristics or the white culture. My whole, whole thing has been, I want to teach him just who his dad is and use that as an example, not my race, the color of my skin. So it, it's, you know, it's one of them where every day, if I can end my day and I can look myself in the mirror and say, you know, today I was the best father that I could have been. I was the best husband. I was the best employee at my job. I was the best brother to my two younger brothers. Just taking that day by day of, of showing him that it's not a four by four lifted truck with, <laughs> you know, and you go deer hunting on the weekends. Because well, what? That's, that's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's teaching him, you know, but on, but on, on the flip side, me being his dad, I can't teach him how to grow up being a young black man. I can't, I can't do that. I can try to give him some exposure. I can take him like we do drive 25 miles south and take him to a black barber shop. Because they do good things. <laughs> you know, I, I, and get him that, you know, and, and we've been going there for a long time, so they know to change the channel, you know, if it's not the right stuff, or to tone down the language when we walk in, you know, and, you know, just, I, I can't, just like Antoine was, was speaking earlier, I can't give him real life experience of, you know, you know, how, how to compose myself, you know, that I'm going to, you know, be, be looked at in a different way because I've, I, I don't, I don't know that I can't teach him that I can only, you know, using Lynette's family or just life experiences to try to get him that exposure. So, you know, for, for just, you know, that side of it, when it comes to your children, it is just, that's an experience on my side that, you know, I, I can't change the fact that I can't teach him that I, I can try to, you know, like I said, you know, exposing to it. But, you know, I don't want him to, to right. He, he, he needs that exposure. He needs that experience because 
he is different. He, he looks different from when he's in, when he's in the classroom his whole life, when he looks to the left or right, it's going to be very rare that he sees someone that looks like him. You know, when he, you know, grows up and he gets in the workforce, when he looks to the left or right, it's going to be very rare that he sees someone at his job that looks like him. And, you know, for just for us with, with the love and everything else of just trying to get him, you know, just, just strong and just love who he is. And that's what just, you know, at the start of this, you know, this, this video that just still just eats me to the core of knowing that he was trying his best not to be who God made him to be. And that's what mm -hmm. we've been trying to teach them is God made you special. You, you, you are so special that you don't have to change who you are, what your image is, just, you know, just grow and embrace your, your, you know, your, your, your culture, your, your, just everything around you. And I just mumbled a lot, but. <laughs> that's good, James. It was good. Yeah, that's good. And so for me, that's what we want to do. We want to teach our children to be good people. Like, I, like when I go in a room, I don't lead with, hi, I'm Lynette and I'm married to a white man. I, that's not who I lead with. I hope <laughs> that they see <laughs> I hope they see that how they see Jesus. You know, I, I anytime we go, whether we go to church, if I go to work, if I go to the grocery store, the school, it is my prayer that anything that's not like you, God, remove it right now in the name of Jesus. So that I'm hoping that they don't see Lynette, because Lynette can get right. Like I get crook sometimes. So I'm hoping that they don't see that part. I want them to see Jesus. <laughs> so I thank y'all for allowing us to be a part of it because we don't speak about these things out loud all the time. We do discuss it with our children just because it's something that they deal with and that we want them to be aware and not be caught off guard by it. Um, but like in my community, we're, we're people in our community, people know us. So we don't constantly, that's not what we go out with and say, this is happening, this is happening. We don't do that. So I appreciate you giving us the opportunity to do that this way. Because sometimes it's raw. Like you just, you saw us earlier, it, it gets raw. Mm. And when you can't talk about it or you don't talk about it outside of your walls, it feels confining. So mm -hmm. I appreciate mm. the, the platform. I appreciate the understanding because what we are, our goal in life is to raise two children, a, a, a man and a woman who saw their mother was a godly woman. Their father was a godly example. And in turn, they can turn that around because they know we may not like everything that people do to us, regardless of if it's because of our color, because we have different opinions. But we want them to see we don't like what they do, but we have to love them. And that's something I told mm -hmm. Jameson in that principal's office with tears rolling down my face. And it was the hardest thing I ever had to say because I was so angry. I told him, I said, regardless of what is done to you, we may not like it, but we have to love them to get to heaven. So that's what I want to teach my children. We got to love. It's all about love. And if I can love yeah. myself and he can love himself and we love each other for who we are, then we can love our brother as we love ourselves. When I don't love myself, I can't love you the right way. That's all right. So that's, that's right. what that's what I want to take. I want people to take away from it is that we have to teach our children, teach ourselves first, then in turn, teach our children the love of Christ. And then we can do, we can be better. Amen. 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 And Torn, pass the last of this. Uh, for me, it's uh, Micah chapter six. Um, is what should I bring before the Lord when I come to bow before God on high? Should I come before him with burnt offerings with year old calves? Would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with 10,000 strings of oil? Should I give my firstborn for transgression, the offspring of my body for my own sin? Mankind, he has told each of you what is good and what is the Lord and what it is the Lord requires of you to act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. So this is not about, I, God is not pleased with the economic prosperity of this nation. Um, God is not um, concerned with politics as we are. Mm. What he wants from us is to act justly. So mm. when I think of what injustice is, it occurs when, when power is misused. So um, when that power is misused, it denies and robs people of their rights. 
And so when I talk about, when I think when the scripture talks about act justly, that's what he's calling us to do. So there's a micro level, like my neighbor, and then there's a system level. And so when we identify injustices where he, where God tells us to love our neighbors, that's something personal. And that's something that we have to require. But when we talk about systems, we have to look at the individuals who create the system. So mm -hmm. um, I think the indictment is we, we, we don't, the indictment is that some of us benefit from the system. And so um, yeah. I believe what the pandemic, COVID-19, and all the things are, are doing is disrupting the system. System. So yeah. we're moving from institutions to mission. And so I think that's the paradigm shift. So what I'm encouraged is to see the, um, Lynette and James. What I'm encouraged with is to see Truth um, Reveal podcast. What I'm encouraged is the work that Gina and her husband are doing. So that lets me know that I'm not Elijah believing that I'm the only one serving God. Mm, um, it lets yeah. me know that there are people who are understanding that, okay, I can't just sit on this anymore because good news, bad news, it's knocking at our own front door. So yeah. as long mm. as it's somewhere else, um, we can tolerate it. But, mm -hmm. but this is what I told some local pastors. I said, if we're not proactive, then we're going to try to talk to each other when it happens in our community. So what we have to be, um, what I think these conversations are sparking is, well, once one, one time we're told to obey cops and just follow orders. And then you, I think God is just allowing this thing, these things to be exposed. And then the next thing, a guy obeys the cop um, and he still shot up. And so what mm -hmm. ends up happening is we're starting to see the frailty of the system. We're starting to see how churches are overlooking um, what's in their backyards. And God is so gracious and long suffering. He's just giving us an opportunity to correct it. And that's mm -hmm. all he's doing. He chastises those he loves. And yeah. so we can't avoid these conversations. I think God has given us boldness to confront and um, and I just want to speak to the host. Um, don't despise the days of small beginnings because um, somebody is going to hear this and be provoked to change. Mm. And isn't that what, what it's about? They may yeah. never come to our churches. They may start their own. Focus on Say that. Say the last part of what you said again. Oh, yeah. You're talking about not one person. Uh -oh. can alone. One trip. We can't yeah. hear you, Pastor Lassiter. Let's get you back in focus. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Okay, here we go. So now yeah. say that last so part of what it. you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I just don't. Be yeah, my thing was no one person can do it alone. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to take the collective the collective efforts of the yeah. church. And I believe that it's our it's out of our misery that ministry is birthed. So mm -hmm. I think when you have the burden for it, it's because it comes from God. One of the things that I just encourage all of us, um, you're seeing it for a reason. You're feeling it for a reason. It's mm -hmm. to bring glory to God. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Hey Amen. Um, <clears throat> my final words would just be um, that in order to have honest conversations, you have to first be honest with yourself. And, you know, because I can't say that every thought that I've ever had about a white person was good, nor can I say that every thought that I've ever had about my own people was good. Because we can't live in this society and be bar bombarded with the images that we're bombarded with and not develop certain uh, prejudices or preconceived notions about one another. Yeah. I just think about the scripture where it talks about to work out your own soul salvation. Soul salvation. Yeah. You know, it's like our spirits are saved, but we got to work out our own soul salvation. And sometimes those images that we're presented with, the experiences that we may have that we use to shape our judgments of other people get down into our souls and we have to work those out. But sometimes we can't just do that by scripture sometimes we have to sit and we have to talk so that mm -hmm. as we talk and we confess our faults one to another we can be healed mm 
you know, and so it's so important that we first start with being honest with ourselves and then begin to have the honest dialogue in our churches, around our tables, wherever we are, so that we can bring awareness uh, in order to bridge the gap between uh, the races. So, Amen. So. Amen. Well, my uh, final words will just be uh, words of gratitude, man. I, I'm just so full right now. I thank God for all of you. I, look, I only person I've met before this uh, was Pastor Lasseter, but I thank God for Pastor Lasseter's wisdom yes. uh, and his heart. Thank you so much, Call Wells, Lynette, and James, for yes, your just being you. transparent. Man, y'all blessed me real good. Yeah. yeah. And, and to expose that just for the good of uh, of just having a heart of wanting to see other people um, be all right and, and just to help. <clears throat> and Gina with her, her warrior princess spirit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Like, you know, that the common denominator with us all is Jesus Christ. Yes. I'm telling you, Jesus will level the playing field. I don't care yeah. about your white privilege, so whatever it's called, white privilege, black privilege, Jesus, hallelujah, yes. will always level that playing field. And yes. y'all who are looking at us on this live or will look at the recording, this is how it's supposed to be done. Yeah. We can have the discourse. This is, th th this is how you know, you want to know how I can not be bitter and I, I can still be aware of what's going on, but I don't have to hate white people mm -hmm. or I don't have to be bitter and angry all the time. And I can still be quote unquote woke um, because Jesus is that is that level playing field. And he allowed me to see uh, uh, my my sins and my faults and show me how much grace God has given me so where I can give grace to another. Um, and like Pastor Lasseter said, we, we, we're not trusting in the system. We're trusting in Jesus Christ. So I, my final words is just, I'm just so grateful for what the Lord has allowed to transpire here. Thankful for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, man, we're just going to keep keep going in Jesus' Yeah. Name. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, I will say uh, the title of the podcast is Truth Revealed. And so when April and Holly and I were discussing what we wanted to discuss and, you know, what some of our episodes and things of that nature, it was burst out of the situation with Ahmad Arbery. Um, but we didn't want to necessarily talk about Ahmad Arbery, but we wanted to bring some light to race and our, our stance that we have to take because we're all believers. And so I believe that the truth that we have revealed on this podcast tonight is that the church definitely has a place it has a voice and it needs to roar and it needs to roar loud. And we need to be the Imagio Day. We are the image of God. And if we are the image of God, then we know that our God is concerned about justice. Our God is concerned. The blood of all will be heard and he hears and he sees. And so I am so thankful for every person that has taken time out of their schedule to listen, to log in. I'm thankful for the experiences that we all have. Um, we all have a part, we all play a part and no part is too small. I think the conversation has to come in place, has to take place around the dinner table. We have to be intentional with our, um, with our roar. We don't have mm -hmm. to roar to the same people. We need to roar to others. And we need mm -hmm. to stand firm in that and not back down because society, because society and um, the enemy will have us thinking and believing that because our roar is loud, that it's over-exaggerated. But it mm -hmm. is not. Mm -hmm. It is not. It is never an over-exaggeration when we're talking about blood being um, slain and lives being lost and what we have to remember is that all souls belong to God yeah. all souls belong to him and so I think the truth that we have revealed is that one we have a voice as a church we need to use our voice we need to have the hard conversations we need to say it from the pulpit and at the dinner table and mm -hmm. at the end of the day we have to be aware that offenses will come 
Yeah. They will come. They wow. are coming for you. <laughs> but when they come, as my sister has taught me, we have to decide whether or not we are going to sit in a fence mm -hmm. or whether we are going to extend grace. And so many times we get up from the table when a fence happens and we don't mm -hmm. extend grace and therefore we don't grow. And so I would encourage each of us as we are aware and woke or not woke, extend grace because that's what the Lord has done for all of us. He's extended grace. Yes. Thank you all so Thank much. You. Ooh. Yay. Thank, Thank you guys you. so much for being a part. Um, we will have all of the information for Gina, for Antoine, oh, yeah, and yeah. for James and Lynette um, in the show notes. So if you want to get in touch with them, we'll provide um, avenues for you to do that. Gina released a book. It's called Separated by the Border. <laughs> yeah. It is an awesome, awesome book. It deals with um, a birth mother, a foster mother, and a migrant's child, 3,000 mile journey. Um, it, will, it will bless your life. You will cry, mm -hmm. you will be mad, and you will smile, and you will laugh. And mm -hmm. it was wonderfully written. Antoine is working on a book. Oh, Yay. What? So you guys will be kept abreast about that. And I'm just so glad. And Lynette is releasing yes. a new podcast yeah. as well as a release of her website. Yeah. You can find her at Lynette Caldwell. Dot com. And spell, oh. spell it out. Hey. Uh oh, she didn't left. Spell it out for them so they, because your name's spelled different than. Okay. Yeah. It's L I N E T T E. C O L W E L L dot com. All right. <laughs> Sweet Lord, we done lost her. <laughs> Lord, is she coming I'm back? Take over Holly. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> we, any, anybody else wanted to say what their websites, Gina? I think you have one and you and you have a blog. Go ahead, tell the people. <laughs> I do. It's Gina Thomas dot com, G E N A T H O M A S dot com. Thank okay. you so much for hosting this conversation. What a beautiful yes, yes. conversation. Thank you guys for coming on. We really appreciate you. And how well, Pastor Lassiter, Pastor Lassiter, what about your podcast? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, tell us. Yeah, you can find us on um, all, I, I love saying this, Gina, on all major platforms, Spotify, oh, yeah. Apple, uh, oh. <laughs> Google. Uh, it's called Unapologetic, and it's yes. the Thinking of Podcast. So uh, thank you for allowing me to share sure. and nice meeting you uh, Lynette and James I appreciate you miss you Gina miss you too man <laughs> yeah. Yeah. oh thank you guys that's sweet like my sweet, sweet I know <laughs> I was hoping she would come back on before we <laughs> left off but I don't want to hold you guys any longer than what we have so thank you so much thank for joining so us much. this is another episode of the Truth Reveal podcast thank you to our guests we love bye. and appreciate you y'all have an amazing evening bye, bye. Uh, thank you <laughs> thank you thank guys you. so much Lord sweet still ain't came back on okay. <laughs> <laughs>